Uh, all right, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'm gonna call the meeting of Monday, February 27th, the Tanchmark Council Committee of the Whole to order. And I'd like to acknowledge that we are located within the territory of the Mi'kmaq, the unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, first on the agenda, I'd be looking for uh, approval of the agenda. Somebody to move that? Moved by Councillor Finney, seconded by Councillor Gauguin. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried, thank you. Um, I'd also like to uh, ask if there's any disclosure of interest for the meeting um, today from any of council. We do have some items uh, further on in the agenda for the community development grants. Just want to make sure that, uh, oh, sorry. Yep, Councillor Estabrooks, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Black. That is exactly the one I was going to raise. Um, so I'll stay at any discussion on that, where, seeing as I'm the president of Sacramento Minor Hockey. Thank you. Anyone else? No, nope, seeing none. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, second on the agenda is a presentation from the Rural Health Action Group. Hello there. Nice to see everyone today. I do have a presentation. Is that being projected on your screens at all? There we are. Okay, thank you. So I'm Margaret Toos King, and I am here as the co-chair of the Member of Tantramar Community Task Force. Um, Pat Estabrooks is here with me, and she's going to be joining me at the podium in a few moments, and John Hyam sends his regrets. Pat and John are co-chairs of the Rural Health Action Group, which is one of the action groups of the task force, and I was just invited to do the presentation, which I will present to you at this point. It is, uh, for, for many people, this might be a new story, or you might only know pieces of the story, and so we're going to do our best to run through a little bit of a timeline, because here, at the end of February 2023, we are at a point of change in the work that we're doing on behalf of rural health care in our area, and we want to get everybody up to speed. So a bit of history. Uh, people know that our hospital has been under threat of closure for more than two decades. And in the past, our, our, our region has always had action committees around saving the hospital. People may remember the We Care Committee. We had a lot of community volunteers involved with that over the years. And Sackville Town Council uh, played a key role in helping to save uh, the hospital at all these points at which uh, the government tried to uh, threaten to close it. Our Rural Health Action Group, though, was formed, um, if you remember, in March 2021. It was the middle of a pandemic, and there was yet one more closure announcement for our hospital, and we needed some leadership. And at the time, John Hyam was mayor of the town of Sackville and pulled together a committee at that time to take action. Uh, former Mayor Pat Estabrooks, who is here, was also a key player because she was chair of the Sackville Memorial Hospital Foundation at the time. Um, the group that they pulled together included a whole variety of people that you would know, uh, people from the university, seniors in the community, retired health professionals, and all sorts of other community volunteers. In June 2021, that was the, the fateful moment when our ER uh, started getting closed on weekends. And we were called to action before the new council was sworn in. And so this group continued to work and joined with the Memorial Cook Tantramar Community Task Force as one of the action groups so that it could strengthen its work uh, by dint of numbers. And just as a reminder, the task force was formed in April 2020, and I know that some of you here um, were part of it. And it mobilized more than 200 volunteers across our region during the pandemic, doing things like making sure people had food, making sure there were mental health supports with the schools, a whole variety of things <clears throat> back then when we really didn't know what was going to be happening. And so the task force was still very active in 2021, and uh, we expanded to include the issue of rural health care. So over 2021, we built local support. We started talking about why is this system working this way? It's never worked before, and nobody's really fixed it to our uh, preferences. So we started to do consultations in the community um, and looked at developing some strategic goals. We also met privately with the then CEO, John Dornan, 
found that we had very positive common ground and um, began to feel some hope. And if people know Pat Estabrooks, for her to feel hope on this issue, it really was an interesting meeting. So we did begin to feel hopeful. And during the winter, the whole Horizon Health Network also said they were interested in collaborating with us. I think that they were realizing that they were not coming up with solutions and they were really in dire straits. And so they did consultations with us and with the municipality. We sorted out who was gonna do what and the Rural Health Action Group took the lead in the community efforts to develop a collaborative relationship with the Horizon Health Network and see if we could work together on solving some of the significant problems locally and in healthcare more widely. So we developed a framework along with the Horizon Health Network. It took months to agree on what our goals would be and who would work on what and how we would measure whether or if we achieved those goals. But by June 2022, um, we had an agreement among us and we have been meeting with them ever since, if not weekly, then monthly, depending on who the people are within the Horizon Health Network. Our relationship with the Horizon Health Network um, is as follows. There is a joint project steering committee, and then there are also working groups within our Rural Health Action Group. The weekly updates occur with our members, and then we meet monthly on a steering committee as well with them. Uh, when it comes to communication, we try to collaborate. We do not release information that we know about what Horizon Health is doing without their first releasing it and vice versa. It's been important for us to be able to maintain the trust so that we can actually work differently with the Horizon Health Network. But our Rural Health Action Group really is a bunch of unpaid volunteers. And I said at a recent meeting to them, you will never get such a skilled group of retired baby boomers who were willing to do this work for nothing as you have right now. Among the people at our table, we have retired professional nursing consultants, a retired marketing executive, a retired physician. We have a retired dean of nursing among our ranks. So when we talk about nursing and training, we have expertise among us. That's probably unique in the province. The local priorities that we brought to the table that were important to us, we wanted to build and sustain community trust that the Sackville Memorial Hospital would be here to stay. And one of the highest priorities there was keeping staffing. And as we know, our ER closures were because we did not have staff. So staffing was a number one thing. We wanted to also look at outcomes for rural health because as you recall in the last few years they keep consolidating services to the larger centers and away from rural areas and we don't think that that's feasible and we um, argued very strongly for uh, maintaining and growing rural health care in our area. To improve uh, level of care and reduce risk for patients we wanted to ensure full staffing um, with a collaborative structure for ongoing recruitment. That meant that we wanted to be involved with helping to find doctors and nurses, willing to play a role in finding them, um, enticing them to the region, that kind of thing. We wanted to restore emergency department access, retain our access to inpatient services. So we wanted, when our loved ones went into the hospital, we wanted to see them here and not have to drive to Moncton because we have a good hospital here. We also wanted to explore additional services, for instance, walk-in clinics. So many people don't have family doctors. I, for one, know my doctor has never seen me when I'm sick. You know, you can't get in when you're sick. I have to go to the emergency, just like everyone else. So we knew that we needed to change primary care access for everyone in our region. We also wanted to look at different ways to enhance the number of nurses, physicians, and nurse practitioners. Nurse practitioners have become more and more important in the last couple years because they're a level of healthcare that has an ability to meet some of those basic needs to do 
basic prescribing of antibiotics for ear infections and things like that to triage people to say, oh, this is really serious, you need to see a doctor, or we can do this in the community. So they're really an important linchpin that I think we're going to see more and more of when it comes to the kind of health care we need, basically. Specifically, we talked about staff morale. We had heard people were feeling that their jobs were precarious, you know, the hospital's going to close, why would I stay here? So that was a priority for us to, to maintain morale, to address retention and recruitment. We needed to have a stable workplace that we would hire people to and keep them here. We also wanted to see investments in our hospital. We felt things had been left to deteriorate. And quite frankly, I don't think we should have to hold bake sales to pay for core medical equipment. So that was also an issue. We wanted to see more collaboration among healthcare services and we wanted them provided locally. We wanted to increase the number of physicians and other processes for electronic record keeping. If you don't have electronic records, you cannot collaborate with other health professionals, and that is something that's an issue across Canada, not just here. We wanted both urgent care and primary care provisions outside of having to go to the emergency department. We wanted to make our hospital more attractive so that we would get uh, more nurses and more doctors. That meant looking at work schedules, doing continued education, providing upgrading opportunities, so making it a much better workplace for people to come to. We also wanted to address the long-term care issue, keeping our seniors close to home, but not turning our hospital itself into a long-term care facility. And of course, mental health services. Everybody we've talked with says that we have inadequate mental health services, and that's an ongoing issue. We also were quite clear that we want the community involved in defining what our own priorities are. And to date, if people have been around the block a few times, like some of us, we've all been consulted so many times, we say the same things and we don't see the changes. So we want to have more substantial um, consultation with us and we want to have a voice in what the de determining what our priorities are. So within our action group, we broke uh, one, one group hived off called the Services Design Working Group. They were created because we needed up-to-date information and data to support our recommendations. And when we looked at the New Brunswick Healthcare and other consultations, all of the data to date was out of date. You know, we needed to get some updated information. So because we have some retired consultants on our staff, paid nothing, um, we did our own research project. We did a whole bunch of interviews, we gathered data, we collated it, and we presented it to the government. And it was very credible, and they were really glad to see it, because during the pandemic, that kind of activity just wasn't being done by that Horizon Health Network. So we, we provided them with data and presented them with the results. And as we say, this would have cost tens of thousands of dollars if they commissioned it by anyone else, but we were able to do that. So some of the results that we have, and we're calling it Collaboration 1.0, because we're going to be talking about 2.0 in a minute. But during this first year of collaboration, one of the priorities was to build and sustain community trust that the hospital would be here to stay. Here are some of the results. We've seen changes in the organization, changes in management, improvements in staffing. We've seen opportunities for education and upgrading that weren't there before. There are new recruitment tools, larger roles for the community in determining priorities and in determining what the long-term outcomes we want to see. There's been community recruitment. Uh, there's a site that uh, people in the previous council for the town of Sackville would know the town of Sackville paid for. So there is a website just for Sackville just for physicians and nurses to attract them to our community. So now it's connected with the Horizon Health Network, digital marketing, and what was interesting when we started meeting with them a year ago, their links were broken, their site was outdated, and because we led the way, we've improved the overall marketing that Horizon Health does. 
We have appeared at recruitment events with physicians and nurses. There's an organization called Thrive NB that is helping to deal with the housing gap uh, that we're working with. There also is a community toolkit to assist with community recruitment and retention that is informed by our efforts. When it comes to the priority of investing more in services to help improve health outcomes in rural areas, our service design working group provided an informed vision and it was received positively by the Horizon Health Network. In addition, when it comes to improving the level of care and redu reducing the risk for patients, we are working on ensuring full staffing at the hospital. Um, right now, there are 19 of 24 nurses in place. The ER service um, is fully staffed. The community um, is filling the gap in lifestyle portion of recruitment, so we're telling them how nice our region is. As I say, we're working with Thrive NB. Um, young physicians have told us that they will come here if we have collaborative team approaches to healthcare. No longer are physicians wanting to have, they're running their, their practice like it's a private business. They want to have other allied professionals they connect with and they want to have teams that they work with. With respect to restoring the emergency department access, we are still short some, but we are also seeing nurse practitioners in the emergency room. That is reducing the load of those uh, for physicians to see the ones who are more sick. Um, we're uh, seeking a pilot kiosk for online service so that if people are at home and they don't have access to the online nursing or physicians that they can come to the hospital and get it there so there's a different way for them to get care. When it comes to retaining access to inpatient services, um, there are investments in the, ER, in the operating room that people would have heard. We're going to have a second operating room. The Brunswick unit is now sufficient for acute patients. We continue to have laboratory services at the hospital. That was under threat at one point. Um, there are management changes. And we are trying to coordinate our OR and our ER with physician services from Moncton. Looking at additional services, we have presented some suggestions to them that comes from our research. Exploring opportunities to enhance numbers of nurses and physicians and nurse practitioners. Well, we're, there are nurse practitioners in Port Elgin and we're asking for more there and we're asking that nurse practitioners are part of the medical team, that those will be the kinds of regular healthcare professionals we'll have access to as well. So as we said, the town is hosting an online medical professional recruitment link. Um, the Horizon has, Health Network has invested in digital marketing of our site the nursing recruitment goals for the ER and Brunswick are nearly filled. Um, we were able to send some volunteers to a physician event, and we had over 30 contacts of physicians at that event who might be interested in coming here. Um, there are investments that you know have been announced in expanding the OR. They've invested in assisting new recruits to New Brunswick. And we're also, they're looking at collaborating with other communities um, the way they're collaborating with us. You know, they found it to be valuable and effective to work with communities, and that is a huge step of progress for us. Um, we do meet regularly with the trustee and with the CAO of Horizon. We met with them recently to discuss next steps, and they are very positive about moving forward with us for another year. So we are calling it Collaboration 2.0. And what the suggestion for that is that we retain any of the unaccomplished goals, so we're not stopping what we were working on, but then we're also going to be looking at outlining a vision for complementary services. We want to complete our nurse and physician recruitment. We want to get back to 24-hour emergency room services. Um, we want to have health teams. We want to have the community involved in developing the vision for rural health care. Um, we are feeling pleased with the degree of process and also pleased that Horizon Health Network is still willing to talk with us and work with us. Um, already 2.0 is underway and they have hired a staff to coordinate that work with us um, this year, so that's a vote of confidence. We recognize that 2.0 may require different expertise and different approaches. Um, we now have two new municipalities, so we need to clarify the roles of the municipalities and the relationships. 
we need to encourage getting the information technology and space and digital connections and all those things that we need for us to have that model of healthcare that we, we do need. It is much more complex, but it is moving us more toward that model of healthcare that we all need where everyone has access to it and citizens have a voice in determining what the vision is of that healthcare. So in summary, we feel like we've done a credible job. Good things have been happening. We do have the ear and the confidence of decision makers in the Horizon Health Network. The needs of the community have been well represented during very difficult times, i.e. pandemic. Um, we're meeting with Straight Shores next week for this similar kind of presentation. We do want to improve everything we're doing. We want to improve our structure, our processes, our communication, and our coordination and our effectiveness in continuing to make progress. We know that healthcare is still precarious. We still need to solidify the involvement of the community in governance, in decision making, and it is a big outstanding issue for us. People who have long enough memories know that our hospital was built by the community. It was run by the community. The community had a voice and that hasn't been present there for a long time. And I think we're seeing the results of that. So we feel very strongly about the governance issue being one of the major issues going forward is how do we entrench a voice of the community that has uh, decision-making influence going forward. So our questions are, uh, for you, really are looking at where we can move forward together on this. Um, maybe share some, you can share some of your views on what next steps should be or could be. Uh, do you have any new information that we should know about? And, and we do have to say, we, we can't tell you everything we hear from Horizon. You have to wait for the press releases. Um, but this was the, the other thing I wanted to say. So what we learned over the last year is if Horizon Health Network called a mayor, they would tick a box and say, oh yeah, we consulted with the community. And we know that that isn't consultation, but that counts as consultation when we're dealing with something like the Horizon Health Network. So that's why we are so keen on making sure that anything that we're doing in the community is in coordination with the things that you are doing. We all have different important roles if we are going to see the vision of our region and our communities having the health care that we need. So that's where we want to discuss with you. Perhaps it's through a mayor with Councillor Esterbrooks and Mayor Black. As we understand, Councillor Esterbrooks, you're going to be working with us on this, which is fabulous to hear. Um, but we really would like you to accept this report. Uh, Pat and I are here to answer questions. In fact, I think Pat had a few words. She let me go first. Yep. Pat? And I've been told I have to stand in front of the mic. Uh, I mean, I, I have a loud voice, but that's all right. Um, just a couple of things. Number one is I hope you're listening closely to what's been said here today. Healthcare is very important, and, and it's... Uh, we need it. It's one of the uh, things that will bring people into our community and keep people in, their, in our community. We also have to consider the university who brings at least 2,500 kids here every year. And um, I'm not sure what we would do without that. I know some people think that's not so, but I, I truly believe the university brings much, much to this community. So it's so important that we're all on the same page and that we all talk to each other, which sometimes we have difficulties doing. So I'll tell you what, folks, if I see you're not talking with us, I'm going to talk to you. Uh, I just tell you that just so you'll be ready. <laughs> so my first question to you is I note it. Um, one of the newscasts uh, on, I believe it was CBC, that uh, councillors and mayors had met with the, um, the municipalities uh, group. And uh, you were discussing health care. And I want to tell you guys, that's the first time that I've ever heard tell of the mun municipalities discussing health care because it was never part of our mandate. So my concern is, uh, or uh, my question is, uh, what were the topics and were they basically the same as what they are here? Everybody's concerned about shortage of nurses and doctors and ER closures and all that stuff. 
Um, was there any uh, discussion on uh, uh, health care being a line item in your budget from now on? I'm, I'm, I know you had, or last year there was uh, some monies for us. I'm just wondering if that's a possibility that that might have been discussed. And the one that I think is the most important is governance. We need local governance. We cannot operate with a 30... 20 or 30 member board trying to find out what we need for our area here. So um, local governance is very important. So I was wondering if that, uh, if that was discussed. And again, just to encourage you that this is something that we need for this area. And I mean, we've been talking about this for years and nobody, some of us did not take uh, ear on this and listen to what people are saying. So. The time is now that we have to work together and continue to work together and not stop in two years. It's going to be an ongoing thing for many, many years. And the first item uh, that I guess uh, that I wanted to just bring to your attention, uh, in the um, recommendations and suggestions that we made to um, uh, Horizon, one of the issues that we described was the delay in um, ambulance to Brunswick offloads and the fact that our patient population has increased, resulting in an increase in uh, New Brunswick, uh, ambulance New Brunswick calls. There is a failure to utilize resources. Some fire departments, Dorchester, Port Elgin, and Memory Cook, have first trained responders, but do not consistently receive medical assistance first responders calls. And my understanding is that Dorchester Fire Department has received a letter from MedaV suggesting that they will not be calling on them because they have uh, changed the uh, radio system that they are using and the one that Dorchester has will not connect. So that is terrible. It's going to be more delays uh, for people who may need to get to the hospital quickly. And I'm wondering again if you folks have had any information on that. It, it should be a high topic to discuss and understand why this is being done and um, somehow or other convince the government that we need those first responders. And I think Port Elgin is in that area too where they were uh, first responders. So those are the two concerns I have and, and uh, perhaps we'd like to hear comments and also on our report which I think is very important. I hope you'll get a copy of it and read it. Read it. That would be your reading for the next... Uh, how many years? Four years? <laughs> okay, Margaret, do you want to step up here and help us if there's any questions? Mayor. <laughs> um, I just want to say first, thank you very, very, very much. I know that, that uh, the, the presentation was a little long, but I think it was important for everybody to get an understanding of, and I'm certainly not pointing fingers, but um, is it important for everybody to get, a, to get an understanding of where the Rural Health Action Group um, has been, where they're, uh, where they're going to? especially for new councillors who might not be familiar with it. So thank you very much. Um, I just had a couple of clarifying questions when you were saying, um, uh, when you were talking about the, is it the Union of Municipalities of New Brunswick? Is that what you were, you were asking about? Um, and you mentioned a budget line item. Is that budget line item for uh, the town of Tantramar or, okay. And um, okay, so I'll start really quickly if I can, I'll, I'll touch on the UMNB piece. Um, the Union of Municipalities of New Brunswick has always had some resolutions around health care because health care has always been a concern within the province. Um, some of those resolutions have come from Sackville in the past. I'm not exactly sure about Dorchester. Um, but uh, it, it becomes more of a municipal concern, which it really shouldn't be, honestly. It is a provincial matter. But like housing, for example, the, the lines are becoming blurred between what is local government and what is... Um, provincial government responsibility. So um, UMNB, for their part, they have scrapped all of their medical, sorry, uh, healthcare resolutions and have struck a healthcare committee. Um, that is going to be, I think they're going to get underway in March. And that healthcare committee will be able to sort of jump on healthcare related issues as they come up um, to be uh, a little more um, uh, responsive, I guess, to the, to the concerns of healthcare across the province. Um, they have a mandate within their advocacy to push for whatever issues the members um, uh, respond to. Uh, so that's, I guess that's the UMN, UMNB piece. Um, I have had conversations through UMNB and it's, I, you know, I, I can't take 
my hat off as mayor of Tantramar as well, but I've had conversations with a couple of ministers and um, Susan Holt, the liberal leader, uh, the mayor of uh, Fredericton as well, and all of them have talked about the work that uh, Sackville, or the Rural Health Action Group, has been doing for healthcare um, in the province. So, you know, here we are in our, our small town with our important rural hospital, um, trying to maintain it, trying to keep it off, uh, you know, up and running, and that message is being heard across the province, which I think is really something to be uh, celebrated. Um, a budget line item for healthcare, I might have to turn that over to the CAO um, or Ms. Hartling, but I will speak for the governance piece of it really quickly. Um, Deputy Mayor Martin and I were at the, um, uh, the announcement at the hospital this week, and a question was asked by CHMA reporter Erica Butler uh, about sort of next steps, and um, both uh, Minister Fitch and Margaret Melanson spoke to uh, governance. And I, they were using it sort of broad terms, but talking about what that might look like for a structure for Horizon going forward, uh, and what sort of role community would play uh, in that, which I thought was really great that they said that, because if there is a change that might need to happen uh, as far as hospitals being more accountable to the rural area, um, that's a, a really good first step. Um, Anyway, I'll, I'll be quiet. I know there's other questions <laughs> around the table. Um, did you want to sure. ask? Okay, go ahead. I'm on. Yep. Good. Um, so just as far as budget, uh, directors have only been recently presented as, as, as council with the 2023 budget. Um, so as far as specific line items, um, they're still working with what they have. We just kind of have that bottom line figure and are kind of, you know, reallocating it and as needed. So, you know, I, I don't want to say yes or no, but certainly if there's a, a level of commitment or request, submit it to, you know, submit it through uh, Ms. Miller's department and, and we'll, we'll have a look at it. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who is first. Councillor Finney. Um, could you tell me, as a matter of fact, sometimes... Uh, staff get uh, overlooked as a matter of fact for instance i'm thinking about the union and staff the workers the cleaners and stuff have they been consulted as well as a matter of fact as to what is needed within the hospital i mean they're frontline workers people they forget sometimes because management thinks because they're not as well educated that they don't know what's going on but they're the frontline workers and i'm just wondering are they being consulted as well uh, along with experts you know marketing and our doctors and our nurses practitioners and just one have they been consulted because i i'm going to be honest with you i'll tell you now i'm hearing from some of them they feel neglected i'm just letting you know up front you know the whole healthcare system right the whole how everybody's bearing the brunt over the last few years um, when we did our consultation, it was with allied professionals, so it wasn't actually anybody within the hospitals. People like pharmacists, physiotherapists, you know, people working in the community who connect with the system. But I think your point is well taken. I think it's been a really tough few years, and a lot of people are just holding on with their fingernails. I think that's a good, a good question. We don't, we don't ask management how they're managing their staff within the hospital to a great extent. We're not, you know, we haven't asked that question, but I think raising the issue of care for all the employees is something that we could do, absolutely. We, don't, we haven't gone into that kind of detail, though. But I, just on, on that uh, note, uh, Horizons did take a major step by bringing back uh, one of their uh, employees who uh, actually was on retirement, Nancy Parker, and she and her management staff have done wonderful things, talking with nurses, finding out why they're unhappy, um, you know, what can we do to make working conditions better. So they have come a long way as far as working with staff. I can't uh, comment on doctors, but I know nursing staff in particular, and um, I think with the addition of some nurse uh, practitioners, uh, that has made a huge difference uh, at the hospital and in, in the, with the ERs as well. So I think uh, somewhat uh, what you're saying is that there are always concerns because they've had a hard two or three years. And, um, but I think morale has changed and I think people are looking at it as being positive. And the one thing that Horizon has said 
is that Sackville Hospital will remain a hospital for acute care, and that's what they were looking to hear too, because they were told that the beds would be changed to long-term care. It's an acute care, and they, the beds will remain acute care with the hope of adding other services as well there. So I think the answer to your question, yes, staff seems to be happier uh, than they were originally. Yep, follow up, please. Um, what I'm asking, though, really, you talked about the management team and the working with the nurses and stuff. I'm talking about the cleaners and stuff. Have you consulted with them or the union reps to find out exactly? I mean, those people who do the cleaning and have been around in and around the whole place for years, they might have some great ideas for you. Um, and so I think uh, they should be consulted because, as I said, I've talked to some of them, and they feel like nobody's even, they're just being ignored and nobody's talking to them. And I know unions, when we talk, you know, negotiations, things are difficult, but they're going to be affected as well. So maybe they've got some ideas, and so maybe consult with them as well, just to get some ideas. Please and thank you. Um, I'll just follow up quickly. I thought it was uh, when we toured the, uh, the redone emergency department, uh, it was beautiful, well lit, just wonderful. The colors were really nice. And they said that the, the same job, and not, not that this is only, it's only one piece of it, uh, Councillor Finney, but they said that they were gonna be redoing the cafeteria as well with all new fixtures, all new, um, like to make it sort of match what, what the look and the feel was, was in the emergency, emergency department, which was light and airy and fresh and, um, you know, and maybe that will work towards uh, helping um, some of the staff have, you know, uplifted morale potentially, but. I, and two years ago, they were going to close it. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. What I'm, what I'm trying to get through is the fact that talking to those workers to get their perspectives, not the fact of making it light and breezy in a brand new environment, find out what their ideas are. Ask them. They're, they're pretty smart people. They don't have a PhD, but they're pretty smart people, I can tell you. And so ask them what they think, what they feel they think is needed in Sackville, in the hospital. You know. Anyway, that's what I was trying to get across. Thank you. Councillor Wiggins, call off. Thank you, Mayor Blatt. Uh, thank you, Margaret and uh, uh, Pat. Oh, goodness. Uh, I'm so happy to hear, uh, Margaret, when you said you were going to reach out to uh, Straight Shores. As you know, me, I was on both uh, the Tantamar, Mamacourt Tantamar Task Force and the Rural Health Action Group as capacity of mayor. You're doing a great job. And uh, I would also like you not to forget, because as we met on October the 14th, we had a meeting here with all the ministers, Minister Holden, and, and the CAOs and the uh, president from Mount A. We all met together and the four regional mayors were there. And uh, so I'm wondering too, if, if when you reach out to say Straight Shores, if you remember, don't forget Member Cook. You know, Mac Timms has been a great supporter. He served on all these uh, uh, boards when, when we were there. So, and, and he still reiterates that he's very interested, like they use, Member Cook uses our hospital a lot. So, but very great work you're doing and I'm glad to see you reaching out to Straight Shores and, and just very good work. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, any other questions from council? I just had one more quick thing to say. I promise it will be quick to everybody. Um, you also were asking about medical first responders. Um, you amend, and just talking about the UMNB piece, but um, I met with the uh, Dorchester Fire Department to ask about that, that issue at one of their officers meetings. Um, so UMNB met with uh, the Minister of Public Safety and Justice. We have a standing resolution about uh, an umbrella approach to um, PSAB um, so, uh, dispatching in the province, a provincial dispatch, an overall provincial dispatch and what that might look like. But we brought up the, uh, the medical first responder piece as well. Uh, there was no promise made by the minister's office, but they, uh, they took it rather seriously because of the uh, recent drop in medical first response calls in communities like Dorchester, for example. Um, and anyway, they, they took that very seriously and, um, and would be looking into that along with um, 
the other protective services uh, um, departments around the province. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, Councillor Esterbrooks, sorry. Good. Most of my, uh, thank you, Mayor Black, most of my comments have been touched on already. That's good. Um, so I just want to say it's a lot of positive work. Um, from my, where I look from where we were a while ago um, to where we are now, I look at it as a positive. And the fact one of your statements was we're only four doctors and two RNs away from full-time emergency department. So I think that's something we can attain. So just positive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, moving on to um, agenda 3.1, which is the levy on the lake. That's found on page three of the package. And that's uh, Mr. Pride. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, members of council. Uh, as you know, the levy on the lake has been taking place for a few years now. The last two summers, it's taken place in and around uh, Lilos Fawcett Park. It includes uh, workshops, concerts, um, a reimagining of the the old Fawcett Dance Hall and, and several other pieces as well. Uh, in order to operate the festival, uh, the, the organizers, the Intangible Culture and Heritage Council in New Brunswick requires some support from council. So they are asking for the following, uh, for permission to host a meal uh, that would distribute alcohol at a secured area in the park on Friday the 18th of August. Uh, they're asking for a temporary street closure of Main Street from Morris Drive to Church Street on August 19th from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and a rain date of the 20th. This is the same street closure that they had last year. Uh, they're asking to waive the rental fees of town-owned properties that we can lend them, tables, chairs, picnic tables, that sort of thing, as well as the fire boat uh, pending its availability. And that would be for uh, from August 17th to the 20th. Uh, they're asking for permission to operate a beer garden um, on August 19th as well as August 20th in Lawless Fawcett Park. And uh, they'd like to erect the tents, the event tents as early as Tuesday, the August 15th at the park. And they're, they're asking for a few noise exemptions uh, for August 17th and 19th at the Music Barn and August 18th at the park for the concerts. So it's very similar to the motions that were presented last year. And uh, as, as uh, staff here, we're happy to continue to support the, the festival. Happy to ask, answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Pride. Any questions from Council? Council Butcher. Am I misremembering last year was Levy in the Lake and the triathlon held in conjunction? And if so, is that a plan for this year as well, or do we not know that yet? Uh, that, that's the next item on the agenda. So, yeah. Uh, Councillor Gauguin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Black. Uh, just two questions. Um, I know closing off the street might be kind of a, a bit rough for the people that live on that side of town. But have they looked at putting the stage at a different spot? I know it's kind of a weird spot where they put it. Um, and have there any been any complaints about the road closure in the past? Mr. Pride. Thank you, Councillor. Um, it is a bit of a weird spot. We did look at other options. The stage was actually in on the other side of the bridge there the first year. And that didn't really work out that well. There's a bit of a current going under the bridge, so it was difficult for kayakers and canoes to, to set up shop to watch the music or listen to the music. So then they moved to the other side. We looked at the beach, but the stage is too big to fit there with the, with the playground. Uh, so we thought that, that was the best location. Um, the street closure has worked out quite well. The, we have uh, detour signs and they have volunteers at the closure sites as well uh, to, to redirect any traffic that might, to, might, might need to access locally, like on Morris Drive, for example. So there haven't been any uh, complaints to us about the street closure last year. Councillor Tower. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, uh, I think this is fantastic. I, I, I Levy the Lake is going to be our Stan Rogers Festival, the way it's going. It's, it's getting bigger. It's being known right across Canada, and it's even known in the States, as uh, some people from California have mentioned. Uh, I'm just curious uh, about the uh, 
the fire boat. Uh, is it left there or is it manned by the fire department? Or how is that handled? That <laughs> Chief Bowser. Thank you, Your Worship. The fire boat, if it's readily available and I have the members to attend and staff that boat, then it would be on the water for that event, for the duration of the event. Any other questions from council? Opportunity for discussion. Seeing none. Okay, um, there is a motion uh, for uh, 3.1 in the agenda as well, if uh, the councilor would be willing to read that. Anyone? Sure. Councilor Tower. I move that council direct item 3-1, levy on the lake, to be sent to the regular council meeting on March 14, 2023, for consideration. Moved by Councillor Tower, seconded by Councillor Finney. Call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pride. Uh, 3.2 is Stockville Triathlon, and that's again Mr. Pride. Thank you again. Um, the Sackville Swim Club has been organizing the triathlon since 2017, and it was organized by the Tantamar Outdoor Club for many years before that. Uh, this year, they're looking to have the, the race take place on Saturday, August 19th, the same day as Levy on the Lake. Spoiler. Um, uh, they, the organizers have collaborated well in the past, and they, and they plan on doing so again this year. Uh, to accommodate the the uh, triathlon, they require a street closure as well, and it's slightly different than the Levy Street closure. Um, it would take, it would again be closing Main Street from Donald Harper Drive up to uh, Station Road, uh, for uh, as well as a small section of Church Street from McPhee to Main on August 19th from approximately 8.30 in the morning until noon. Um, and uh, furthermore, uh, they, we would ask council to approve waiving rental fees for some town-owned properties. Again, tables, picnic tables, bike racks, that sort of thing. And uh, they, they also do ask for the fire boat to be in the water, understanding that it's there for emergency purposes only, and should they be called away to uh, use the boat for on, a, on an emergency call elsewhere, that uh, that would take priority. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Pride. Any questions from council uh, for the triathlon? Seeing none, okay. So again, we have a motion for uh, 3.2 of the agenda as well. Somebody would like to read that? Council Estabrooks. Sure, thank you, Mayor Black. Uh, I move that council direct item 3.2 Sackville Triathlon be sent to the regular council meeting of March 14th, 2023 for consideration. Moved by Council Estabrooks, seconded by Councilor Finney. Uh, call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much, Mr. Pride. <laughs> On to 3.2, community development grants. Um, Councilor Esterbrooks, did you, were you going to step out? And once again, this is Mr. Pride. Thank you again. Uh, so the former town of Sackville has been issuing grants for many, many years, as has Dorchester. Uh, in 2015, Sackville Town Council approved the Community Development Grants Policy. So we continued to evaluate the grants using the scoring matrix and, and based on the uh, requirements in that policy. Uh, there's four different categories, special events projects, um, operational grants, small capital, and sponsorship grants. And this is the first year that applications were accepted from outside of the former town of Sackville boundaries. So they were the, uh, the applications were reviewed by myself, uh, the director of corporate services, and the manager of tourism business development, as we've done in the past. 
And overall, in 2023, we received requests in the amount of $156,479, uh, which is a considerable increase from the, from the past few years. Um, part of that is due to business getting going again uh, after the pandemic, and part of that is uh, attributed to some new applications that we haven't had in the past. Um, I should I also want to mention that the village did have about $5,000 in grants that they gave out to community groups uh, each year as well. Uh, we, in 2023, the operating budget uh, shows that we have approximately $105,000 in funding for community grants, but we also know that uh, there are going to be groups that aren't used to the granting process from outside of the town of Sackville um, boundaries. So we recommend leaving a little flexi flexibility for 2023 as those grant requests are likely to come in throughout the year. So attached are the recommendations below uh, based on the scoring matrix, totaling $97,700 in, uh, in grants. Um, I'm not going to go through them each individually, but I can say that the, uh, the majority of the regular applicants, most of them are regular applicants, and they are, they're all getting very similar funding or recommended similar funding to last year. And uh, there are a few new ones in there as well, so I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Pride. Um, questions, uh, Councillor Gauguin. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor Black. Under the special events project, there's the Intangible Culture Heritage Council in New Brunswick for Levy of the Lake. Is that we're giving them an extra $5,000 to put on their thing, or is that the what it would cost to kind of have the whole weekend set up? Mr. Pride. Uh, thanks for the question. No, these are the recommended amounts that council would be giving these groups. So the, the festival itself costs considerably more than that. That's the town's contribution. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Martin. Just a, a couple questions. I'm not sure exactly how uh, the grant system works. I wonder at some point if there couldn't be a little uh, training or instruction for us folks that are new to council so that we better understand how grants are, how people apply for grants and anything to do with grants. I don't, I have no idea how it works at all. Is it, is it possible to just sometime get some, uh, idea of how it works and uh, first I want to say I apologize I said Councillor Martin it should have been Deputy Mayor Martin for the record um, <clears throat> Ms. Bourne did you want to take a crack at that um, what I was just actually going to speak to if there's anything we, we could work out now especially so that you have an understanding of it before you make you know make a decision um, Mr. Pride could perhaps run through you know you know the basics of the criteria set up for each you know, whether it be small capital, sponsorship, um, each section. So I think, you know, even if you, we could hit two points in each of those and then we can expand the training in, in an orient, orientation session after that as well. Mr. Pride. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the, I mentioned the four categories. Uh, the grant, the call for uh, applications goes out kind of midsummer, kind of the beginning of August, and the, the deadline is October 15th every year. That's right in the, the grant policy. Uh, there are some required documents that groups need to submit. Uh, they need to submit some kind of proof that it was uh, that the application was approved by their board. Uh, they need to submit a budget. Uh, there is a reporting requirement each year, so they need to have, have submitted their report from the previous year to be eligible this year, um, which they all do. Um, the, uh, the other piece, I guess the operational grants are meant for just general operating expenses for a group. So I'll use minor hockey as an example since <laughs> Councillor Estabrooks isn't here, but they, they need to pay for ice, they need to pay for referees, trainings, uh, things like that, new jerseys. So it helps them with those kind of day-to-day -day expenses. Special events and projects are for kind of one-off events or projects. So uh, Anglophone East, for example, um, is applying for some funding for the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, which they did get some funding last year. So that's a reading program for kids in the schools. And uh, then someone like Levy on the Lake or Sabi Fest, they have their weekend events each year, so they would apply for a special events grant for those. 
uh, and those special events grants, the maximum amount of money that they can be approved for is five thousand uh, dollars. The other piece is the small capital. Uh, we'll pay for up to five thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, up to fifty percent of a small capital type project. So um, this year, the golf Sackville Golf Course applied for some funding to uh, upgrade their watering system. And uh, the Sackville Community Garden applied for some funding for the first time to ex uh, upgrade some of their accessibility and their trails around the garden and to uh, add more edible plants. So those are kind of physical things that would happen on, on a site. Uh, and like I said, we can give them up to $5,000 for those ones. And uh, the, the Legion, the Golf Course, the Tantamar Heritage Trust, there's been several groups over the years that have taken advantage of those small capital projects as well. That answer your question. Distribute to council as well, so that you can see it. Yep. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Pride. Uh, Councillor Finney, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Mr. Pride, can you tell me? You said there's three of you that are actually looking at the grants and making the decisions as who gets what and whatever. Are there any time that actually maybe one might have to step out because of uh, maybe a conflict of interest uh, in relation to maybe a family member or a friend that could be connected with a certain group within town? Mr. Pride? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, there's, there's three of us that review them and give recommendations to the council for council to approve who gets how much funding they get. But uh, yes, there are a couple instances where we do have to step out of the room. Um, Mr. Kelly Spurls is involved with uh, Live Bait Theater and, and uh, Performers Company Theater, for example, so he did step out of the room when we discussed those two items. Follow-up, uh, Councillor Finney? Yeah, thank you, as a matter of fact, because people have asked me, uh, because they're aware of, of the same thing, as a matter of fact. So clarification is always good for everybody within the community so they'll understand what's going on. Can you, and one more question. Can you tell me when the three of you took over when it used to be in the hands of the councillor and the treasurer that used to look after the grants? I'm trying to remember how long that ago that was that uh, the three of you took over. Sure. Well, uh, Ms. Miller just started a couple of years ago, so it wasn't her originally, but uh, it was 2015 when the new policy was adopted. Yeah. Um, I just had one quick question. Um, the Sackville Cemetery Incorporated, can you tell me, are they a nonprofit organization, a registered nonprofit? Uh, thank you. Yeah, yes, they are. Okay. Um, the town has funded them in the past, but it's been the past four or five years that they've got funding, so we just felt it was time for someone else to have a turn. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from Council? Oh, Councillor Tower, go ahead. Uh, it's more of a, a comment. I, I started with, I'm glad you're doing and your crew are doing this. I don't think council should be involved with it. I think your matrix you're using is working quite well. I'm very pleased with the new sense it's taken over that way. And I'm also happy that the uh, community gardens is being helped out again too because of Food insecurity is a major problem, and if it helps moving forward, then we have to make use of it. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tower. Uh, any last comments from Council? No? Okay. Um, the, there is a motion for this one as well, 3.3, uh, if someone would be willing to make that motion. Councillor Butcher, go ahead. Uh, I move that Council direct item 3.3 .3, community development grants to be sent to the regular Council meeting of March 14th, 2023 for consideration. Moved by Councillor Butcher, seconded. Councillor Hicks, uh, call for the question. question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Um, can we get somebody to to just Esther. grab uh, yeah, Councilor Esterbrooks to come back in.
<laughs> All right, next on the agenda is uh, point uh, three point four bylaw number five, a bylaw respecting the election of mayor and councillors. And that is Ms. Beal. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> The previous municipalities of Dorchester and Sackville each had bylaws to enact the election of mayor and councillors of Tantamar. For the purpose of the elections, the previous government of Dorchester had one mayor and four at-large councillors, and the previous government of Sackville had one mayor and eight at-large large, councillors. The previous local service districts not incorporated within Tantamar were represented at a provincial level. With the transition to Tantamar, Bylaws will need to be reviewed and created to reflect the changes within the new municipality. As per New Brunswick Regulation 2022-50 under the Local Governance Act, Tantamar is divided into five wards and Council of Tantamar shall consist of the following nine members. The Mayor elect at large, one councillor elected from each ward of one, two, four and five and four councillors elected from Ward 3. Staff are recommending that first reading of bylaw 05 um, would come forward at the March 14th, 2023 regular council meeting for council consideration. Thank you, Ms. Beal. And uh, that bylaw is uh, included in the package as well, pages uh, 13 and 14. The beginning of the arduous task of looking at all of our bylaws and redoing them. Um, any questions from, uh, from council on this one? No? Pretty easy stuff. Okay. Uh, again, there is a motion for that. Um, the motion for 3.4, if somebody was not, uh, Councilor Esterbrooks, go ahead. Oh, there's not. Oh yes, I'm sorry, I apologize, right. That, that will, right, yes, I, right. Um, on to 3.5, uh, policy 2023-03, health and fitness allowance policy, and that's uh, Ms. Goodwin. Thank you, Your Worship, and members of Council. So just a little bit of background information. In February of 2022, the previous Council of Sackville had approved a health and fitness allowance policy for the employees. This was initiated um, by a unionized member who proposed it um, to encourage employee physical health and fitness, which creates a healthy and more productive workplace. With the transition to Tanchmar, employee policies are being reviewed. With the average workforce of 38 in the previous government of Sackville, 20 employees utilized this allowance in 2022, although some didn't use the full $300. So staff are proposing the continuation of the health and fitness allowance policy for Tanchmar, with employees currently submitting claims for 2023. The taxable benefit will continue to be available to all full-time employees working a minimum of 35 hours per week Employees would be eligible to, for reimbursement of eligible health and fitness expenses to a maximum of $300 per calendar year. The policy is attached to the report, um, so it would be our recommendation that council consider approving this policy at their next regular council meeting. That's my report, Your Worship, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Any questions for council? Councillor Tower, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, th I think this is a fabulous idea. We had it in Amy Liquor when I worked there, and I took full advantage of it. So I'm happy to see this still here. And I was just curious, what was the total cost of the first year of it? And just don't need it now. It's not going to change the way I think about it. So, But if you can find that information, I'd like to yep. know it, because I don't think it's a very large cost for health and safety. So. Ms. Hart Ms. Hartling, did you want to take a crack at that? Uh, I'm not sure of the number at the moment, but we can get that and get back to you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Butcher, I think, was next. 
Thank you. Um, I know that it says the average workforce of the previous government of Sackville was 38. What is our full-time workforce now with the community of Tantramar? Just curiosity. Uh, Ms. Bourne? Thank you for the question. Um, it would be 41 full-timers uh, with one vacancy still to fill, so 42 uh, plus a few other vacancies So currently. Uh, thank you. Councillor Finney? Yeah, I was just going to ask. Uh, Ms. Goodwin, could you tell me uh, how many other communities do this? Ms. Goodwin? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Finney. I do not know the answer to that. Um, that is not something we have uh, looked into. Um, like I said, this was brought forward by a unionized uh, employee, and the CAO of the day thought that it was a great initiative, and um, staff are recommending that we continue with that. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Councillor Gauguin. I won't ask as tough of a question, but uh, um, uh, like uh, you said, there was only about 22 that took part of it last year. Um, would that money be transferred into this year? And could they basically, the could we look at e expanding it, like making it more accessible? No? <laughs> Ms. Bourne, do you sure. want to try that? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, so monies that would have been allocated for the previous budget year would have had to have been used in that budget year. Okay. Uh, any other questions from Council? Oh, Councilor Esterbrook, sorry about that. I do have one. Thank you, Mayor Black. Uh, just a question of curiosity. Is this uh, an initiative that made it into the collective agreement with the union or no? That's... Uh, one, and then I have a, a statement. Ms. Goodwin? Yep. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Councillor Estabrooks. Um, this is actually an employee policy, so it's not uh, listed in the collective agreement. It's, uh, like I said, it's an employee policy. Thank you. Councillor Estabrooks, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mayor Black. Um, even with, uh, to, to uh, our CIO's comments about the number of employees, even if we were at full complement, uh, let's say approximately a 45, um, you're still looking at $13,000 or something that has to do with people being healthy and active, and that's a fairly reasonable price. Thank you. Well said. Uh, any, any other comments? No other discussion? No? Okay. Uh, so again, uh, I make sure I got this right this time. Um, 3.5, there is a motion there as well, if somebody would like to read that. Be willing, Councillor Butcher, go ahead. I move that Council direct item 3.5, policy 2023-03 health and fitness allowance policy be sent to the regular Council meeting of March 14th, 2023 for consideration. Moved by Councillor Butcher, seconded by Councillor Esterbrooks. I'll call for the question. question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. I think you're uh, on the stand for the next two. So, uh, so 3.6 policy 2023-04 health and safety policy. Ms. Goodwin again. Thank you, Your Worship. The Joint Health and Safety Committee of Tanchmar is responsible for reviewing safety policy and procedures for Tanchmar. It is a requirement in the province of New Brunswick to have a written safety policy that sets out the responsibilities of the employer and the employees. With the transition uh, to Tanchmar, all the policies are being, currently being reviewed. The Health and Safety Committee for Tanchmar has reviewed and accepted the attached occupational health and safety policy. And the attached has also been reviewed and accepted by the Health and Safety Compliance Department of WorkSafe New Brunswick. So it would be staff's recommendation uh, for council to consider approving the occupational health and safety policy and repeal the previous one at the next regular council meeting. That's my report, Your Worship, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. A very important one. We have to have this. Um, any questions from council on the policy? Again, pretty standard stuff. All right. Um, so 3.6, there's also a motion for that one as well. Councillor Finney, go ahead. 
I move that Council direct item 3.6, policy 2023-04, health and safety policy be sent to the regular Council meeting of March 14th, 2023 for consideration. Moved by Councillor Finney. Seconded, Councillor Estabrooks. I'll call for the question. question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Uh, 3.7, 2023 FCM conference. Again, Ms. Goodwin. Thank you, Your Worship. The annual conference for FCM will be held in Toronto, Ontario from May 25th to 28th of this year. In past years, the former town of Sackville would send the mayor and two councillors to FCM, and uh, those that attended were required to submit a council report around the information received during the conference. Um, Dorchester did not previous, previously send any delegates to FCM, however, they did attend virtually in the past few years. Um, mayor Andrew Black will be attending the FCM annual conference in Toronto, not only as mayor of Tanchamar, but as the president of UMMB, and all of his costs uh, associated with the conference will be covered through uh, that organization. So the list of estimated costs are noted there. The registration is $985 plus HST. That's the early bird pricing, which uh, expires on April 21st of this year. Um, so it would be staff's recommendation um, that council consider approving um, to send the deputy mayor and two councillors to the 2023 um, FCM conference in Toronto, and it would be up to council to determine who the two councillors uh, would be to attend. Um, so that's my report to your worship, and happy to answer any. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Um, I'll make a, a, a quick statement as well. Um, in the past, I mean, we are the town of Tantramar, we are a new municipality. In the past, in the town of Sackville, we used to, uh, we'd send somebody who hadn't been before and sort of go around the table each year as FCM came up so that it wouldn't always be the same councillors going. It gives councillors an opportunity to go and uh, take part in the workshops and the sessions and meet people from across the country, potentially talk to uh, MPs and, um, and, and others. Uh, so that was just something that we had, we had done in the town of Sackville. We are the town of Tanchmar. We have an opportunity to, to do things differently, but I think that might be part of the discussion as well if, uh, if you guys want to have that discussion. Um, so anyway, I guess the, there's an opportunity to discuss whether we want to do this. Um, and is the recommendation from staff the way that council uh, would like to see this go? And then possibly also who would like to attend? Uh, Councillor Butcher. Thank you. I was fortunate enough to be able to attend FCM back in 2016. Um, and the, personally, I found it to be an incredible learning experience. I had so many opportunities to learn so much um, about how other municipalities do things, how all these exciting initiatives that other places um, were, were doing. Uh, there are things that I learned then that I still am using and thinking about in my um, daily life. I think that it is a fabulous opportunity. Uh, I'm thrilled to see that the recommendation is that we will still send three. I would be willing to entertain the possibility of sending more simply because we're a new council. Um, you know, there are three of us councillors who have had the opportunity to go before, which means there are five that have not before, and I'm, I'm not thinking we should, well, maybe I am, I don't know. I just think that the opportunities there are great, and I think that everyone should have an opportunity to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to, to, um, uh, to, to support the concept of three or more attending. Thanks. Thank you. I was at the first FCM with you in 2016. I think that might be the only one I've ever attended, I think. Yeah. Um, any other discussion from council? Councilor Finney, go ahead. I've always said that the FCM is very, very important for us to go to. Without talking to these people in person, we have no idea what's going around, going across, happening across the country. Um, you get an insight that's just Unbelievable, you can't, I don't know how to describe it. Um, 
this here virtual? No, you, you don't get a chance to talk to people uh, after or a number of people because of the fact that it's virtual. You're talking to a couple of people, that's it. Um, the thing is, is I like the idea, what uh, Councillor Butcher is saying, is spending, maybe sending uh, four councillors and the deputy mayor because of the fact it's a new entity and the way things are going um, and give us a chance to talk uh, to some of the federal ministers as well. And uh, I think it would be really, really uh, beneficial for us to turn around and look at that prospect because it will be beneficial in the long run. Any other comments? Council Butcher again. Sorry, I know, my second one. It's okay. um, so it's in Toronto this year. Do we know where it is the next year? Because obviously, depending on where the conference is, it factors greatly into the expense. So um, I'm wondering where it's going to be next year, like Fredericton or Halifax? Oh, bummer. No, it's in uh, Calgary next year. Yep, further away. And I'm not sure where it is the year after that, but it's in, it'll be in Calgary next year. The last one in Calgary was in 2007. Councilor Um I would love to have the opportunity to go. I, I really enjoyed UMNB and being a new councillor, obviously I got to learn a lot of things. Um, if we were, I know nobody likes roommates, but we could cut down expenses somewhere. It's like, I'm just thinking money-wise, like, you know, because that's how I am. But, you know, we could double occupancy, you know, type deal. I don't know. <laughs> That's why this is a discussion meeting. <laughs> uh, Council Brooks. Yes, thank you, Mayor Black. Um, I'm always looking at the, the bottom line, too. And I mean, when you total up everything, um, and I, I, I attended the FCM conference last year virtually, and I took a lot away from it. I brought my reports back. And I'm listening to my colleagues up here saying, you know, how, how good it is to be away. But I also have to be cognizant of the fact that it's $3,258 each um, to get people here um, and we're moving them across the country in a plane so um, I have mixed emotions uh, whether you know we should send um, three people actually four people from here we happen to be lucky we're getting one to go on somebody else's dime um, but you know almost $10,000 in, in travel for this conference I'm always looking at, at, at value, I guess, um, primarily, and the location where it is. So that leads to where my, I like these discussion meetings because my mind can wander, so thank you. Um, <laughs> Councillor Butcher's point of where it was in the next year, maybe, I mean, from a, from a cost uh, perspective, if we were to uh, make sure that everybody on this council got the one within their term or something. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, I'd like to hear what others think. That's a good point. I and uh, as far as UMNB goes, I will be at the FCM next year as well. Those costs will be covered by UMNB as well. Um, I, I just wanted to put that out there, so it's a, a little bit of a savings for the town in that respect, I guess. But um, Councillor Butcher, uh, well, yeah, go ahead. Just a quick comment. I I I also <laughs> think that saving money is a good idea, and I like Councillor. Gogan's idea, but uh, for the record, I'm only willing to share a room with uh, Councillor Wiggins Caldwell. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Beale, did you want to? Thank you. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, a few years ago, we stopped uh, the sharing of the rooms. It's very um, awkward for a lot of people. People like their privacy, and that's just uh, something we don't do as a municipality anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Tower, go ahead. Yes, yeah, thank you, and thank you for that. Uh, I definitely agree with the reason why it was changed, and, and I thought it was an awesome idea. I think attending this is also super important, too, although I will agree with Councilor Estabrooks that uh, going four might be extreme beyond you know, a deputy mayor and three councilors is I think is a great involvement in the following year you could have the same situation happen so you're going to cut through a lot real quick so um, I think four is extreme but it is great experience to be there 
and we know that uh, SAC will benefit be for being involved with that with the million dollar grant towards this building. And now that we're going to Tantamar, maybe one of our projects could also benefit from it. So I think it's a great idea, but three councillors, not four, please. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Tower. Um, yeah, it, it's difficult to put a value on going to these, which is why part of it is the there has to be reporting when council comes back. So uh, adequate reporting about why you're there, what happened, some things you brought back for your community. I remember in 2016 when Councillor Butcher and myself and I think it was uh, Mayor Hyam at the time, uh, Mayor Hyam and myself and uh, former CAO, sat down with CN, and that was the first discussion that we had for the Shignecto Isthmus Project, which would eventually eventually become the Shignecto Isthmus Project. Uh, and that happened at FCM, which, uh, I mean, it seems like a long time ago. Something should have happened since then. <laughs> since then. But um, anyway, so it, it, it is difficult to put a number on the value uh, of going to these events, but uh, I guess that's where you hope that the mayor and council, deputy mayor, would... Um, bring back as much information as they can, push hard on the issues that are uh, concern your community, um, to Councillor Finney's point with members of parliament, potentially, which usually there are lots of them around. Um, so anyway, just wanted to say that. Councillor Tower, you have a follow-up? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just um, for the combination, uh, we've always tried to maintain one experienced person who has been there with new ones. So in this situation, we could have one experienced councillor, and then we could have the deputy mayor, who is not experienced to go into that, but we'll pick up some great experience, and then we could add two new councillors with that combination, and I think it will benefit this council big time. Thank you. Councillor wiggins Caldwell. Yes, Mayor Black. Uh, what's our count now? I'm confused. It's gone kind of around. How many, well, how many do we have? Right. So, oh. so I guess um, for... Direction for staff. I mean, I'm going regardless uh, okay. through UMMB, so I will be there for sure. Um, but I guess just some direction for staff. Do we want to stick with the recommendation, which is Deputy Mayor and two? Um, in the past, we've sent three. It was the Mayor and two. But since my cost is uh, covered, then you know, we have this opportunity. But uh, do we want to stick with that? I guess that's uh, we'll, we'll need some direction going forward. So, Councillor Finney, do you just have a... I was going to tell you, as a matter of fact, uh, why don't we try to find out exactly where the FCM is going to be for the next four years? There's eight of us here, there's two per year, and then turn around and determine who would like to go where. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I'm, I think that's possible. I don't know for sure, but like you said, Calgary's next year. Um, so let's see if they do have a determination maybe as to where they're going to be for the other final two years. I'm, uh, I'm still new to the FCM board. I'm not exactly sure how the process works, but I, I, I suspect that if they knew where it was going to be, they, they would have released that. Maybe I don't know, but. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Goodwin. Thank you. The uh, 2025 FCM conference will be held in Ottawa. Okay. Back, in Ottawa. Back in Ottawa again. That's where it was in 2016. Okay, so Toronto, then Calgary, and then Ottawa. Okay. <laughs> well, and, and the presumably the uh, the FCM in Ottawa will be there'll be lots more MPs. I mean, usually you know just across the street kind of thing, so they'll be able to pull in people from uh, from Parliament a lot easier. But anyway, um, okay. So again, we need some direction for staff. Are, 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 is everyone okay with the recommendation of the deputy mayor and two? Okay. Council Butcher, go ahead. I have a suggestion. Since we know that Ottawa and Toronto are closer, and I am assuming would be less would be a, a lesser expense to go. What if we said that we've got eight councillors? What if three go to Ottawa, three go to Toronto, and two go to Calgary? And then within three years, we would have our entire, um, our entire council having attended. I, I heard what Councillor Tower said about having someone who is, um, who is like a, an experienced councillor going, but 
um, I feel like Mayor Black and I were super, super lucky to be able to go in our first year as councillors because we learned so much and I think that that uh, was to our benefit and hopefully to the town's benefit throughout our, um, our term. And if you wait until your final term as uh, on council, then it, it feels like you've had three years where the opportunity for that learning was, was wasted. So um, uh, that's my suggestion. Maybe not wasted, but doesn't but, feel as fresh. Yeah, not as fresh. Councilor Tower. Oh, thank you. Just as a added note to that, uh, with Deputy Martin going this year, he will be experienced for next year because the mayor won't be going, and if he's still a deputy mayor, then he'll get to go as an experienced one. I guess we also have to consider uh, if if Deputy uh, Mayor Martin can go yeah. <laughs> uh, during that time. Anyway, um, Ms. Beal, did you? Go ahead. I was just going to say at our regular council meeting on March 14th, it's probably better to bring one year at a time just for accountability, a lot could change between now and this time next year. So my recommendation would be that there's one motion um, on the 14th to send who we're sending this year. And, you know, we will, uh, Becky and myself will note that, you know, that's a discussion that was had for the two years following that um, and bring that back uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beal. Councillor Gauguin. Um, I'm just throwing this out there, but like, if I wanted to pay my way to go up, like if, could that be possible? Uh, Ms. Beal, do you, or Ms. Bourne, it's up to you. Um, thank you for the question. I, that's not something as staff that we would recommend. All right, so <laughs> once again, uh, are we going to stick with the recommendation of uh, Deputy Mayor and two? Is that uh, agreeable to most of council? Yes? Councillor Tower, quick, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just as a question, if it's brought forward this way, it could still be amended at the meeting uh, as a as an amendment to that motion to make add the third one, then we can debate just that one section without wondering whether we want to add three this time, which I think is a good idea, but that's just me. But uh, Well, it, I mean, we, we could, yeah. but I mean, it, it would be nice to bring something yeah, from well, here to the, yeah, to the meeting. Yeah. There, there is a possibility of that motion coming forward, or if you want to get the opinion now, by polling the councillors, then you'll know whether you want to add three or wait till it comes up and then make an amendment to the motion and then everybody will debate just the amendment. Sure, Councillor Hicks. Yeah. Use, yeah, use, use council butchers. I feel that we should be sticking with uh, Deputy Mayor and two councillors. As it turns out, everybody's gonna get a chance to go eventually anyway. So that's my opinion on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hicks. Deputy Mayor Martin. I think that we should send the Deputy Mayor and two councillors, and I'll check the schedule of the Toronto Blue Jays. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Making plans already. <clears throat> um, okay, well, I guess I'm, I'm hearing that, that I think we're going to stick with the recommendation at this point. Um, leading into the regular council meeting in March. Okay. Um, so there is a motion, uh, 3.7 in the motion sheet. If anybody, oh, I'm sorry. Um, Ms. Ms. Goodwin, go ahead. Um, for the, thank you, Your Worship. For the motion, if um, there's a decision today on who will be attending, um, that would be great. Um, if not, it'll be a discussion at the March regular council meeting. All right, so yeah, we've, we've, gone, we've gone about 20 minutes on this topic, so we'll, we'll throw another 20 minutes in. <laughs> Ms. Beal, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, the early bird registration um, doesn't close until April 21st, so, you know, if there, there isn't a consensus, tonight, consensus 
this afternoon of the two members that would be attending uh, with the deputy mayor. That certainly can come later as long as it comes before that 21st deadline. So we will have a regular meeting in uh, March and one in April as well. Right, so the, mo so the motion would read a deputy mayor and two <coughs> councillors, but it wouldn't have to specifically say their name as long as we get it in before the registration, the exactly. early bird registration, okay. Um, <coughs> deputy Mayor Martin, did you have something else to say or was your no, well, mic just on? To make the motion. Oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll save it. Um, Councillor Butcher, go ahead. I'm just wondering if there are any councillors now that at this point in time already know that they either would not be able to go or are not interested in going to mm. narrow our parameters sure. a bit. Just wondering, I mean, maybe people don't know yet. Well, so uh, who would like to go, I guess? Councillor Hicks? Well, ah, that microphone, it's terrible. Um, so Councillor Hicks, just in case people couldn't hear, he uh, Councillor Hicks has said that he stated that he would not be able to make it this year. Uh, Councillor Esterbrooks, go. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Esterbrooks. Yeah, be out as well for this year. So, okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Wiggins Caldwell. Just, just hold on. Wait to your. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Your mic was. Your mic just wasn't on. Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I have to check dates, but I, there is a possibility that I might be able to make it. Okay. Any anyone else interested in going? I'll just relinquish it oh. to Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Gauguin? Um, obviously, I've made it clear that, you know, I would like to go, so, okay. yes. <laughs> Any Anyone else? Go ahead. I would be interested in going, but I'm old councillor rather than new councillor, so. Okay. Okay, so, <laughs> so we have uh, Councillor Wiggins Caldwell, Councillor Gauguin, and Councillor Butcher, and the Deputy Mayor. All right. Uh, so we have three <laughs> the Deputy Mayor in three instead of the Deputy Mayor in two. Um, do we, so do we need names, Ms. Beal, Ms. Goodwin, or should we, uh, consider? It certainly would simplify if we had the names for the motion on the 14th. It's not the end all be all, but okay. it certainly would simplify the process and the motion would be done, passed and clear. Council Butcher. So as someone who uh, in the <laughs> recent past of 2016 was able to go, I would say that if Councillor Wiggins Caldwell and Councillor Gauguin are both able to go, then I would certainly relinquish my, but if Councillor Wiggins Caldwell is not able to go, then I, I would gladly go. So. Okay. All right. So uh, I guess would you, you'll be, would you be okay with putting those two names forward if, if they can attend? Um, is that all right with council then? Councillor Finney's, Councillor Finney's waiting for Ottawa. I just want to say, I like to go to all of them because of the fact that they're beneficial. Yeah. But Great. that's, reality is, uh, we did one time in my first term and we went to Newfoundland, St. John's, and it was phenomenal. And uh, it, was it expensive? Yeah. But the benefits and the return on your investment was well, well worth it. It's like... It's like I can compare what we passed earlier about $13,000 for the $300 per person for the health thing. I mean, it's a benefit. So that's my perspective on it. Thank you. It. But I'll wait till Ottawa. Thank you. All right. So we'll put uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, Councillor Wiggins, sorry, Deputy Mayor Martin, uh, Councillor Wiggins, Caldwell, and Councillor Gauguin's names forward at this point. Okay. Um, Deputy Mayor Martin, did you want to read the motion? I moved that Council Direct Item 3.7, 2023 FCM Conference be sent to the regular Council meeting of March the 14th, 2023 for consideration. Moved by Deputy Mayor Martin, seconded by Councillor Finney. Call for the question. 
All those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. <sighs> Take a breather for a second. <clears throat> okay. Uh, next on the agenda is depart, uh, departmental reports. Um, 4.1 on the agenda is the corporate compliance report. Um, we do not have uh, our manager um, uh, here this evening. That uh, report can be found on page 28 of the agenda. Moving on to 4.2, active living and culture. And that is Mr. Pride. <coughs> Thank you, Worship, members of council. Uh, so we've had a busy month. Um, we've been uh, meeting with the various community groups in Dorchester, getting to know them still. Um, we started working with Mount Allison uh, around uh, developing a plan for the kayak and canoe rental program up at Silver Lake for this summer. I also have been speaking with the uh, Westmoreland Historical Society in Dorchester about the, uh, the library, which is housed in one of their buildings. And uh, we're getting ready for our big departmental move down to the Veterans uh, Civic Center in April into the offices there. In the, in the parks and facilities, uh, we do have rubber mats that have been brought in and they're being installed as we speak at the Civic Center uh, to allow people to walk from the dressing rooms down one hall to the dressing rooms down the other hall uh, without damaging their skates. And also, there was a lot of damage up at Beach Hill Park during an ice storm that I mentioned last uh, last council meeting, but uh, the trails are, have all been cleared and it's safe for people to use again. And the Dorchester rink's been very heavily used since the ice has been put in, and I know I've been down there quite a few times myself, which is nice to see, and the, and the, the school uses it regularly. We have a lot of programs going on this winter. You can see the list there. Um, we also have a full list of March break activities planned, and uh, you can find that schedule on our website at sackville.com backslash programs. And this year, Mountie Day will take place on March 30th, um, 2023, and we'll have uh, details available about that soon. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pride. Councillor Hicks, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You might have to lean over a little yep. bit so you're on camera. Thank you, Mayor Black. Uh, Mr. Pride, I see in your report that there's a recreation and sports subsidy, and that's only open to former town of Sackville taxpayers. We are the town of Dantamar now. I'm wondering why this is only open to town of Sackville taxpayers. And we became the town of Sackville, or town of Tantamar January 1st, and this project runs till June 30th, 2023. Mr. Pride. Thank you for the question. So uh, that program was approved by the former town of Sackville Council as a pilot project that would end in the end, at the end of June this year. So for now, it's only available for Sackville, former Sackville taxpayers, but it's going to be reassessed leading up into the end of June to see if it's something that council wants to continue with. And when they continue with it, then they can make that decision about expanding it to outside of the old town limits. Uh, Follow-up, Councillor Hicks, go ahead. If this was approved by last uh, council, why wasn't it stopped and the last council changed? Why why are we not letting the new town of Tantamar in on this? It doesn't seem fair to the new town of Tantamar, to me. the question I, I don't really have an answer for you but uh, we do have a lot of different policies and bylaws they're gonna have to be reviewed over the next little while um, that fell under just Sackville or just Dorchester in the past and this is this is gonna be one of them so we're just not at that point yet um, I, I live in just down the road from yourself so I have two kids in hockey and they don't get to take advantage of this as well so uh, you know like I said we'll, we'll evaluate it here at the end of the spring and hopefully we can have some money into the budget to continue it and expand it at the end of June. Thank you, Mr. Pride. And the, the money that was budgeted for the sports subsidy came from the 2022 budget. Um, and rather than pulling from our 2023 budget, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so anyway, yes, but you're right. It's something that we'll have to re we'll have to reevaluate um, and see how how that's going to work in the town of Tanchmar for sure. 
Councilor Wiggins Caldwell, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Pride, have you got a date on when the pickleball or the or the other sports that we have uh, for the Dorchester School would have you got a date uh, when those will start? Mr. Pride. Yep. Thank you. Um, I do. It's the week of March 13th. I'd have to get back to you about the which activity is on which evening, but uh, there's. I put in a request for basketball, pickleball, and volleyball at the Dorchester School. Um, the only one I'm not sure about is volleyball. I have to figure out whether or not we have a net to use there, but uh, they, they have been confirmed, so I, I will be advertising that soon. And just to, yep, just follow, to follow up, up to that, uh, what about the equipment that's uh, in the, like the basketballs, the pickleball paddles, and, and they are in the equipment room at the, at the Dorchester School? Are we able to utilize that equipment? Mr. Pride? Uh, yep, thank you for the question. We've been told that we can store equipment there, but we cannot utilize equipment that's owned by the school. So we have basketballs and, and uh, pickleball nets and whatnot that we can store there. We already have that stuff, so uh, equipment won't be a problem other than that volleyball net. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Finney. Uh, Mr. Bride, um, there's some rumors going around that actually uh, the center over in Dorchester is that the rumor is that um, they're going to be tearing out the kitchen in order to turn around and put the Bob Edge and Boxing Club downstairs. There's some concerns about it. Um, is that true or is that still being discussed or what's going on? Because somebody approached me and saw that all the chairs were being torn and thrown out of the, over there in a dumpster and they were wondering what's going on. So could you give me some clarification? I think I read something where you clarified that there's been no definitive decisions made as yet, but I'm just. Mr. Pride. Thank you. Um, yeah, we uh, took a lot of old tables and chairs, most of which were broken or filthy and uh, tossed them. Um, uh, there has been zero truth to us tearing the kitchen out in there. We had a, a cat, we had a user group meeting uh, just last Wednesday with all the various user groups for that building, and we made it quite clear that there's no intentions of whatsoever of keeping the community out of that space. Uh, in, in terms of Bob Edget Boxing Club, that was discussed at that meeting, and uh, there was a couple alternative locations discussed. So. Uh, we got to look into those, but uh, nothing set in stone. For if if we were going to have a group like that, that's going to have a, you know, permanent spot in one of our buildings, that would have to be brought to council before there was any decisions made on it. Just thank you very much. Clears everything, and hopefully our media will put that out to the people, let them know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Finney. Thank you, Mr. Pride. Uh, Councillor Butcher, go ahead. While we're on the um, topic of, of rumors, uh, can you speak to the theft of tables from the community center in Dorchester, or is that something that is not able to be discussed at this point? Uh, thank you. Uh, theft is a bit of a strong word, but um, uh, we did have that meeting with the community groups on the 22nd, and. Uh, and we told them there that that the Deanna Cabman would be available at the Veterans Center from 4 to 6 p.m. the following evening for anyone who wants to come in and pick up a table or a chair and we had uh, that we were giving away, posted on our social media, and when folks got there, the tables were gone. So, um, you know, we're, it's something that we're going to deal with internally. Thank you, Mr. Pride. Um, any other comments from council for the report? No. Thank you, Mr. Bryden. Uh, moving on to community and corporate services and Ms. Miller. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, council. Uh, the departmental report for community and corporate services can be found on uh, page 31 of your package. So this report includes updates from community and corporate services, tourism and business development, and the climate, climate change coordinator uh, for the period between January 15th and February 15th. 
So updates and information for Tantramar are now being shared exclusively on the at Tantramar and B social media platforms. So these include Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, where residents and or visitors may still search uh, Dorchester or Sackville over the next year, we've kept those accounts um, open but posted a closeout message and an automatic reply on Messenger um, to both the accounts. So we'll continue to monitor those to make sure that um, we're not missing any inquiries, but all communications are now streamlined through um, the new Tantramar account. Uh, Tantramar, the Tantramar Heritage Trust and artist Indu Varma hosted the official opening of Sackville, a visual snapshot, um, which took place on February 15th as part of New Brunswick Heritage Week. Uh, the event was very well attended and a plaque with a QR code linking to a detailed description of each image um, in the artwork has been installed. Um, Former advisory committees under the town of Sackville will now operate as standing committees for the interim until the operating procedures for Tantramar are determined. Uh, the Climate Change Advisory Committee um, is taking this opportunity to review and update their terms of reference, and they're looking forward to welcoming their new uh, liaison councillor, Councillor Gogan, at their next meeting. Residents can sign up with our emergency alert system, Voyant Alert, to receive notifications in the event of an emergency. So this is a free service for all residents of Tantramar. And uh, we posted registration information on social media this past week encouraging uh, residents to sign up. And we have seen an increase in our um, uh, registration numbers. And um, I did want to clarify that anyone who had registered uh, previously under Town of Sackville is automatically transferred over. Uh, the Minister of, of Minister, sorry, I've upgraded you. <laughs> the Manager of Tourism and Business Development <laughs> continues to liaise with Destination Southeast, Mount Allison University, and the Avirathon Planning Committee. Um, they're piloting a new monthly tourism and business development newsletter, um, which includes information and dates for upcoming events. And anyone interested in subscribing um, to do that um, can do so by sending their request to visitor at sackville.com. The manager participated in the Mount Allison job fair on February 2nd and completed interviews for the business development slash travel counselor intern position. The manager has begun planning for the Saltscapes, Saltscapes Expo in April, which they will attend with uh, Destination Southeast. And in exciting news, the, the manager was selected to attend the Grossmorn Institute um, activation program, which takes place in April. Um, and this is fully funded opportunity, which is a collaboration between the Grossmorn Institute and the Cody Institute at um, St. FX University. And it teaches participants about how to apply a citizen-led approach to community development, including tourism planning. The Climate Change Coordinator is currently wrapping up final report for Sackville's uh, Environmental Trust Fund um, Year 2 project, uh, which is titled Taking Municipal Action on Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation in Sackville Year 2. So again, this um, the Climate Change Coordinator position is funded through the Environmental Trust Fund, and then it's um, a partnership between um, us and EOS Eco Energy. Um, and we have applied for another year of funding, which we would um, hope to hear about by the end of April, beginning of May. February 2nd was World Wetlands Day, and the coordinator co-hosted a networking and information event with Tantramar manager Ron Kelly Spurls and Lena Gallant at the Tantramar Wetlands Center. Um, and this included local environmental groups and community leaders. Uh, the coordinator was invited to attend the FCM Sustainable Communities Conference in Ottawa, which took place February 7th to 10th, and uh, was asked to sit on a capacity building panel. Um, I'll just end with a reminder that there will be growing pains as we transition to Tantramar, and staff are working to transition our key messaging over. So residents will continue to see logos from Sackville or Dorchester as we work to get all that key messaging transferred over and to create new um, materials for Tantramar. Um, so that's my report, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Any questions from Council on the report? Oh, uh, Councillor Finney, sorry. Yes, uh, Ms. Miller, could you tell me who paid for the climate change coordinator to attend the Sustainable Communities Conference in Ottawa on the 7th to 10th? Uh, Ms. Miller. Uh, thank you for the question. So some of the registrations, we received a lower registration cost because she was a presenter. And um, the some of the budget for climate change initiatives was used to help with the travel and accommodations. 
Any other questions from council? I just wanted to say quickly that I was at the Sustainable Communities Conference as well, and uh, our <laughs> climate change, the climate change coordinator did a fantastic job on the panel. Um, I think that she might have been a little bit nervous being up and up front and in front of everybody, but the panel was was well attended. Lots of great conversation came out of it, and she did a good job representing the town of Tantramar. So I just wanted to say that. Um, any other comments on the on the report? All right. Thanks again, Ms. Miller. Um, moving on to engineering and public works, and that's Mr. Apple. Try again. Uh, seasonal lights will be taken down soon. We're just fitting it in around other work that we've got going on and, and the snow events and ice events that happen. Uh, we've uh, been constructing two kiosks to replace the ones that are in deteriorated condition and couldn't be reused safely next or this, later this year. Those are for special events. We've been doing some mulching of trees and brush along roadsides. Uh, we've dealt with, on the utility side, a water break on Bickerton Avenue in Sackville. Uh, we have uh, Correction Services Canada checking for a water leak at the penitentiary that's uh, consuming a fair bit of water. They're still working on that. We rebuilt a lift station pump on Queen's Road, sewage pumping station, and we also rebuilt a pump and had it installed at the Water Street lift station in Dorchester. The wastewater annual reports were submitted to the uh, authorities having jurisdiction, that being the feds and the province, and we are working on the annual water reports that are due early next month. I won't go into detail about all the things that the mechanics were doing because they were working on vehicles as you might expect, but one noteworthy thing is that we did purchase and receive and have installed a new vehicle lift which has been put to good use since it arrived earlier this month. The contract for the Lawrence Street Phase 3 was awarded to Beal and Inch, and work is expected to start in the field in May for that, with work on the retention pond itself happening in the latter part of August, early September into November but all of the other work would carry on with ditching and culvert crossings and all the utility work that needs to happen uh, through May to December. Beal and Inch also is doing the work for the Pickard Quarry new dike and outlet structure, control structure, and that work also will resume in May. And finally, the development agreement for Kenridge Subdivision Phase 2, Unit 1, was, um, was executed. That's my report. Thank you, Mr. Eppel. Um, questions from Council, Councillor Tower. Yes, I was just wondering, uh, with the damage done to the overpass on Main, is there any information of how much happened and when they're going to possibly do something with it? Mr. Eppel? We were contacted by New Brunswick Department of Transportation when the incident occurred. Um, it was a overheight vehicle, we believe, versus the bridge not having enough clearance. Um, and it is in the westbound lane, and it is on the upstream, sorry, on the downstream side of the bridge, so uphill side of the bridge. It damaged the bottom uh, flange of one of the girders and has caused some out-of-plane distortion there. From my personal bridge experience, um, it is perfectly safe for people to continue to use the bridge, but it will require repairs so that it doesn't become a fatigue issue over time. So I expect that they'll be developing right now repair methodology and then we'll go and implement it. Could include heat straightening, not sure at this stage, but that's, that's DTIs to deal with. We have not got a time frame for that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gauguin. Um, the seasonal lights, does this include Bridge Street? And if so, is there any been talk about keeping them up, like the just the lights that go across? Because I know I've heard a lot of people say that it looks nice at night time and, I don't know, makes it pretty. <laughs> Mr. Apple? 
Yes, uh, so I think right now we're planning to continue doing what we did last year, which is leave those up. Unfortunately, they do have to come down later in the summer because of Sappy Fest and the tents that they put up for that conflict with those lights. So at some point they have to come down anyway. Um, but at this stage, unless someone tells us otherwise, we're planning to leave those there until they have to come down. Any other questions from council? <coughs> Seeing none. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Apple. Um, next on the agenda is protective services, uh, which is on page 34, 35 and 36 of the package. Um, and Chief Bowser, did you want to deliver your report? Thank you, Your Worship, members of council. Sackville Fire and Rescue responded to 18 calls for service from January 15th to February 15th. They included eight commercial fire alarms, five motor vehicle collisions, three utility pole fires, one residential fire alarm, and one rubbish fire. Training sessions that took place in the month were ladder placement, hoisting of tools, ropes and knots, as well as an overview of equipment and supplies from Ambulance to Brunswick, as well as our equipment and station checks. And just as a reminder, uh, to all residents to please ensure your civic number is visible from the roadside. This will enhance the response time for any emergency services if the need arises to respond to your location, as well as you'll always see in my report a 72-hour preparedness to ensure we're ready in the event of an emergency. And that would conclude my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief Bowser. Just for those watching at home, too, the Protective Services uh, report includes bylaw enforcement, animal control, the other two fire departments in Dorchester and Pointe Butte, as well as the RCMP report, um, just for anyone, anyone uh, listening from home. Uh, any questions for Chief Bowser's report? Um, Councillor Tower, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, one for him, then one for staff, I guess, uh, because food's always on my mind. Uh, the pancake breakfast, which is coming up here. Do you have a date for that? Thank you, Councillor Tower. I do not have a date as of yes, but it is our hopes to have another one. We just had one a couple weekends ago uh, to coincide with Winterfest, but it is our hopes to have our annual pancake breakfast now that things are back to a, a bit of normalcy. Very good question, Councillor Tower. I, I agree. Uh, Councillor Butcher. Um, also not really protective services, but um, I see that the Fireman's Carnival is a thing again, yes. It will be happening in person, and that is April 1st. Yes, that is correct, April 1st at our Civic Center. Any follow-up to that? You seem very excited. I think everybody in town is. That's <laughs> one, wonderful news. Um, Councilor Tower, sorry, go ahead. That's all right. The second part was because I... Knows around town, not everybody has their addresses up. Uh, the numbers which they could put up, are they still available through town hall? And what is the cost? Chief Bowser? Thank you, Councillor Tower. They are still available at uh, municipal offices here in, in Sackville, um, but I'm unaware of the cost. Ms. Hartling may be able to share those costs. Ms. Hartling, go ahead. I believe the costs are 15 for small and 20 for the large. Thank you. Any other questions from council? No? Okay. Thank you, Chief Bowser. Um, moving on to financial services, and that's uh, Ms. Hartling. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, staff. Um, within finance and corporate compliance, continue to work on the 2022 year-end processes for former town of Sackville and the village of Dorchester. We continue to work with representatives from, from Sears Insurance and Intact public entities on ensuring insurance requirements are met for 2023. Fleet transfers have now been completed. All vehicles except one leased uh, Point de Butte fire apparatus is in the former Sackville fleet account, now known as the Tanchmar fleet account. The 2023 budget was reviewed and enacted into more detail line items during the month of January and February. This was presented to council at the February 13th special council meeting. Uh, tax rates and transitional tax rates were provided within the detail. 
Uh, with the above, we continue to develop our new accounting system within SAGE uh, for the new entity of Tantramar. Uh, utility uh, revenue has been completed and we're uh, just completing the utility operating for uh, expenses. Uh, we're hoping to have the general operating up and running uh, within March, sometime through the March, between March and April. Uh, and Sackville water and sewer bills for the period of October to December 2022 went out on February 6th and have a due date of February 8th. And that is my report. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hartling. I was uh, shocked to see the total for the, the insurance for Tantramar in 2023, $427,168. Uh, it's crazy. I, I mean, it, it's a it's a province-wide municipal issue of insurance going up year over year over year. I mean, insurance everywhere, but for municipal uh, insurance, it seems to just skyrocket. Um, anyway, uh, any questions from uh, council for the report? Councillor Wiggins Caldwell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just one: uh, the water and sewer bills. When when will they be coming out for the village of Dorchester? Is that well, we 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 did we talked about that before as quarterly where we used to get them at the once a year. So can you tell a little bit on how they're going to be implemented this year, Ms. Arlen? I'm not 100% sure when it's starting, but I do believe that they're going to be going quarterly as well as as the town of Sackville bills go. Um, I don't know if if Ms. Bourne would like to speak on that. Follow up, Ms. Bourne. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, just, just as the background for that, in the past there have been great debate with council um, as well as staff in Dorchester that it would actually be preferable to have quarterly billing. Um, for cash flow reasons, that was never a possibility under a small budget. Uh, so that's, you know, that's another win that we can speak to for amalgamation. Uh, Ms. Miller's department is currently working on drafting a communication that will go out to let uh, residents know of the, of the process. Um, you know, first quarter billing will go out um, probably by April would be my guess. Uh, but it, it'll, it'll be detailed in, in, in the communication that goes out. That I would expect it probably by mid-March, the communication. Is, may I? Uh, yep. Councilor Wiggins, call us. Is uh, still available to uh, pay this at once, like in one, one uh, payment instead of quarterly? Ms. Bourne, did you? Sure, so we understand that, that certain residents may only like to, you know, come mm -hmm. in or pay once. Um, sure, that's, that, that would be an option as well, um, but there will be an option for quarterly paying. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bourne, Ms. Hardling. Any other questions from Council on the report? All right, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to uh, legislative services, and that's Ms. Beal. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, as everyone knows, January 1st, 2023, Tantramar officially became incorporated and the transition work continues. The clerk's office has begun the extensive review of bylaws and policies for Tantramar and these policies and bylaws will be brought forward to council for consideration throughout the year. The clerk's office completed the lien management for municipalities through the municipal management training program with the University of Moncton. The new temporary corporate seal for Tantramar has finally arrived, allowing for official agreements and contracts to be seal, sealed following motions of council. The clerk's office will be proceeding with in-house municipal orientation with mayor and council over the next few months. And also in uh, the report, um, please note that uh, we have listed the committee of the whole and regular council meetings um, until the uh, middle of June. And that's my report. And uh, thank I'm you, happy Ms. to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Beal. Any questions uh, for the report? Councillor Finney, go ahead. I'm curious. Can you tell me about lien management for municipalities? Does that mean people are going to be losing their job? <laughs> Ms. Beal? Ms. Goodwin, sure. <laughs> <laughs> No, that was not the intent of the uh, the training. Um, so this uh, dealt lean management, so there's different uh, belts, as they would explain. So this was white belt training, so just kind of um, 
introducing us to what lean management means in a corporation, so how our processes can be looked at um, so that our time is more effectively used uh, during our work day and, and for the municipality. So no, it has nothing to do with anyone's jobs. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Uh, any other questions from council? Oh, follow up, uh, Councillor yeah. Penny, go ahead. Is it possible for councillors to take some of these courses that both yourself, Ms. Goodwin, and Mrs. Beale are taking? Ms. Goodwin? Uh, so this program is a, a municipal management program that's done through uh, the learning uh, program of uh, at Université de Moncton. It's through the AMAMB, which is the Association for uh, administrators of New Brunswick. So it's uh, it's for administrators at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Any last questions? No? Okay. Uh, so moving on to the CAO report and Ms. Bourne. Thank you, Your Worship and members of council. My report can be found on page 40. Um, so some of this I've carried over just as a review for council. Uh, banking, I'm happy to report uh, everything has been submitted, so we do have access to our accounts. As I've, I've mentioned before, that has not impeded business at all. We have still been able to maintain and keep a good standing with all of our vendors. Um, we do have one new document that we'll bring forward probably uh, for the regular council meeting in March. Uh, just a, a reminder again of audit, and Ms. Hartling spoke to it as well. Um, it's kind of a different year administratively for us. Um, I'm, you know, I continue to work with, with previous Dorchester staff to work on the audit from Dorchester and uh, staff here are working. So we're working on two separate audits, um, which does take significant resources. Uh, UMNB orientation at the beginning or middle part of February, I guess. Uh, I went along with the council to that. I think, you know, a general consensus would be that that was absolutely exceptional uh, an exceptional orientation that was put on. The content was fabulous and uh, a great opportunity for administrators as well as um, new or returning counselors to, to be able to network. Uh, as part of the training program, I did sneak this one in. While the report does cover from January 15th to February 15th, I did sneak this one in there. So this was training, um, and I'll expand on that in the next month's report. Uh, that a few of the directors and myself took through the AMA MB program at, at uh, U to M. Um, and, and that's really just to kind of speak to the ongoing upskilling that we'll be doing with the management team to prepare them for um, specific topics as change management as we deal with transition. But of course, would be, would be great training to take at, at any time. Uh, Southeast Regional Service Commission, so monthly administrator meetings, again, um, we continue to have increased file, and, and this would be one area as well. So you can see the number of committees there that uh, I'll assign staff to for at the next uh, Committee of the Whole. Um, and as well, just a note on dis redistribution of projects, you know, the carryover of projects from Dorchester, so realigning those to their, their appropriate department uh, in the new Tantamar. And just to finally touch on you know, the impact on resources of transition. So obviously we're, we're still chugging along and ensuring that we have continuity of business, um, but it has definitely impacted resources. And I can fully say that staff have not missed a beat. Um, our staff has, has, you know, stepped up in, in every step of the way. And, uh, you know, we'll certainly continue to address gaps as we, as we move forward as Tantramar. Um, so in saying that, I just want to express, you know, appreciation and a thank you to all of our staff that continue to, you know, take on extra files, whether that be inside, outside workers, everyone straight across the board. Uh, so finally, I have our list of Queen's Platinum Jubilee uh, recipi recipients in the Tanchmar area. Um, so as most of you are aware, the Queen, Eliz Queen Elizabeth II approved the creation of the commemorative medal in honor of the 70th anniversary of Her Majesty's accession to the throne. Um, and this was awarded to around 3,000 individuals that have made significant impact in New Brunswick. So I'd like to acknowledge and extend a congratulations to our local recipients. Um, and these are residents of Tantamar and uh, the submissions from our MLA, Megan Minton. So Pat Esterbrooks, Janet Hammock, John Heim, Reg Tower, Quinn McCaskill, Amanda Marlin, Margaret Tutes King, Carol de St. Croix, Marilyn Lurch, David McKellar, Nicole Porter, Connor Poirier, and Dr. Vet Lloyd. Um, and last but not least, our own, uh, His Worship, Andrew Black, was the recipient of the Queen's Jubilee Award. So 
um, quite a, you know, commendable list for our, our Tanchamar area. And that is my report. Happy to take any questions that council may have. Thank you, Ms. Bourne. Uh, Councillor Gauguin. Um, just a quick question. Uh, the Dorchester office is still closed. Uh, do we have any ETA on when that will be reopened or will services be transferred to the VCC? Ms. Bourne. Thank you for the question. Um, we are getting information in kind of, you know, bits and pieces. We don't have anything that has been formally transferred to, to bring to, uh, as a recommendation to council. Um, it is looking like the remediation could be a very large project. So we will be, you know, flipping to a temporary location that we'll, we'll look at through, you know, the various departments and what that looks like to ensure, you know, uh, staff safety as well as we'll have finance there as well. Um, you know, we'll have to look at safes, that sort of thing. So we'll, we don't have an ETA of that right now. I'm actually, you know, there's just information that we learn daily. Um, and these are all, you know, it's, it's really a, a vulnerability that um, wasn't part of amalgamation, but certainly throws, throws a wrench in the, <laughs> in the plan. So we'll certainly address that and have a temporary location set up going forward. Councillor Finney. Yeah, I was just going to say, I noticed in the report I was mentioned that I wasn't able to go to the conference, the meeting up in uh, Fredericton. I was sick that week. I just want clarification. I got sick on Tuesday and I was sick for a whole week. I got sick prior to, because I think it was Saturday prior to Tuesday, that I served 160 women along with some other men, dessert, coffee, tea, and everything. And there was about six of us that got sick. Five of them got COVID-19. I was fortunate enough not to do that. But despite the fact that it was a wonderful time serving 160 women, um, I, of course, don't like getting sick, but I would do it again because I think there's another one coming up. So but I just wanted a clarification that. That's all. Yep, Ms. Bourne, go ahead. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I wouldn't put that in a report, so I was just reporting of, of who was able to attend and, and the situation on it, but I wouldn't necessarily report of that you were sick, but if you'd like to report that, sure. Uh, any, <clears throat> any other comments on the report, Council? No? Okay. <clears throat> um, last but not least, well, maybe it is least, I don't know, um, is the Mayor's report. Uh, it is rather lengthy. I apologize for that. I am not going to go through this whole thing. Uh, it's found on pages 42, 43, and 44, I guess. Um, just a couple of quick highlights. Um, I, you'll notice in the, in the report that I've included UMNB and FCM events. Um, as the president of UMMB, I'm at those events, and I do sit on the board for FCM, so I'm at the events as president of UMMB. It is hugely advantageous, in my, uh, in my opinion, um, to be from the town of Tantramar and be in, in these positions, because chances are, if I talk about an example of a municipality, I'm using my own municipality. Um, I often speak about the town of Tantramar at any of the events that I... Um, that I attend, so I wanted to make sure that those were put in the report um, just in case there were any questions around those. <clears throat> um, Ms. Bourne talked about the Southeast Regional Service Commission, but I'll just touch on a couple of things. Um, uh, that meeting was on the 31st of January. Uh, there's not one in February, there'll be one in March. Um, they touched on a couple of things, I mean, many things, but a couple of big ones. There is a push by Minister Alain for the regional service commissions to come up with their own strategic plan. That plan has to be in place by uh, July 1st. So the Southeast Regional Service Commission, along with the other regional service commissions, will have to uh, go through a strategic planning session um, sometime before then, getting to the point to have one in place for July 1st. They have, uh, the Re Southeast Regional Service Commission has put out a call for applications for all the new positions they have to hire. Um, most of those are in the new mandated services. Uh, so that's underway. And the only other thing I wanted to say was that Roland LeBlanc, who is the chair, uh, sorry, the CEO for the Southeast Regional Service Commission, um, spoke about the opportunity, since we, here, you know, we were in January, the opportunity for the Southeast Regional Service Commission to, to do good things, um, to you know, be on a journey, a fresh path, 
Um, but I wanted to point out specifically that he focused on the relationship between cities and rural communities. Um, it's my opinion of, of being with the Re Southeast Regional Service Commission for the last year and a half as deputy mayor that the rural voice often gets missed, particularly in our area because of the Tri-City um, you know, being a, an economic driver, let's say. Um, I would argue that rural communities are a huge economic driver in their own respect, but oftentimes they seem to get missed. So uh, it was nice to hear him say that. Um, I did attend the uh, Sustainable Communities Conference there were sessions around funding sources. This was the, there were many sessions, but the ones that I attended, uh, funding sources, climate policy, and then affordable and sustainable housing, uh, as well as the session that uh, our, this, the um, climate change coordinator um, had as well. There were two sessions that on um, indigenous perspectives to climate change. So looking at the you know knowledge keepers and how uh, First Nations deal with uh, climate change and how municipalities can use that information and build relationships with First Nations to deal with their own climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation plans. <clears throat> there was a, a uh, session for the affordable and sustainable housing from the GMF, the Green Municipal Fund, and the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Uh, and again, just like in the Southeast Regional Service Commission, the panelists were all from big cities talking about projects that they had done. Um, there were many people in the room who were from rural municipalities, and the first question that was asked on the floor was, what about the rural perspective? Um, I think that that message is, is heard loud and clear from FCM, maybe not so much from the Green Municipal Fund, um, but they, they did hear it uh, uh, quite, a, quite a few times over the weekend, and that session particularly um, was highlighted. And then the last thing I'll say uh, is the, uh, I had a, the last morning that I was there, um, select uh, people who were in attendance got to have a breakfast with uh, Minister Hutchings, who is the Minister of, Re of Rural Economic Development. And she wanted to basically just a round table, you know, free discussion, talking about what is important in our communities. So I wanted to highlight um, a couple of things. I think most people were sick of, of me talking about the uh, Shignecto Isthmus project over the weekend because that was pretty much a, a lot of what I talked about, plus uh, infrastructure funding for the town of Tantramar. But I did mention that to the minister, and she was uh, alarmed. I made the point, she's from Newfoundland, I made the point that if the Shignecto Isthmus floods, that Newfoundland would become even more of an island than it already is. Uh, and and uh, so we had so one on one conversation afterwards because she didn't really know the full scope of, of that project and just what it meant for uh, the Maritimes. Um, <clears throat> and a celebration, uh, Sackville and Dorchester, both Sackville and Dorchester, hit level five on the Partners for Climate uh, Protection, um, uh, which is a greenhouse gas emission reduction plan through the Green Municipal Fund. It's taken years literally years for the two communities to, to get this highest level of achievement. Um, there are 500 communities in the, 500 plus communities in the country that have, have taken this on and only 71 communities have made it to level five. So I wanted to highlight that. There was an award ceremony for, uh, for both um, Dorchester and Sackville to achieve that highest uh, uh, award. So uh, I was there to accept that. I, I had conversations with the Green Municipal Fund people afterwards saying that I don't really feel, I didn't feel that I actually did anything to achieve that other than being on council. There was a lot of work from town staff. Um, our climate change coordinator was there. She probably should have been on stage to accept that award as well. Um, but anyway, uh, it was a, a huge effort by town staff from uh, Dorchester and Sackville to achieve that. Um, anyway, so. Wanted to put that out there and just uh, congratulations to the two communities for winning that award. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions from the, from the report. Councillor Butcher. I'm very verbal this, this meeting, aren't I? I'm just wondering, so Sackville and Dorchester received an award. What does that mean for the town of Tantramar? Does that mean that now Tantramar is at that level as well, or do we need to do some things now because of the outlying areas? Well, um, 
when the award was given, they put, uh, it was up on the screen, at, it has the, the town of Tantramar, and then they put the town of Sackville and town of Dorchester underneath of it um, to recognize that there has been an amalgamation and then there has been a change. Um, I would think that because we have new expanded borders, um, we would probably have to reassess our greenhouse gas emission reduction plan if we were, if we were going to do that. Um, the two communities still have those awards and, I, and it's a huge achievement, but something going forward to think about, uh, the town of Tantramar could look at a, a greenhouse gas reduction plan. Any other questions? Okay. Um, all right, we've reached, uh, so uh, there's always a, um, a spot on the agenda for a closed in camera session, just in case we needed to move anything to that. Uh, we can just skip that. And next will be a question period. And I will remind, um, that is we have 15 minutes in total, uh, public question period, uh, for held for clarification purposes of information presented to council during the committee of the whole uh, meeting pertaining to the agenda items that are on the uh, on the agenda. So I'll open the floor. And please, when you come up to the microphone, um, say who you are, maybe where you're from. Your Worship, Council, I promised myself I'll just uh, making observations now instead of questions. But there will be things and questions that you should answer. Mr. Um, Mr. Feindell, you didn't say your name, by the way. Um, Mr. Feindell, just make sure that, that they are questions. It is, it's a question period, not a, a statement period. But if you have oh, some questions to ask, uh, well, that would be great. I thought these observations would help you answer questions, but I can ask them as questions. Sure. Uh, you are the, the mayor of the new town of Tantamar. You are also ex officio member of every committee. The parliamentary procedure, and most here would not know it, uh, one of my jobs was directly with Parliament to look at policies and procedures and incidents. That's all I can share with you about that. Uh, normally, the act, the new act, does say that you will chair all meetings, but that actually means regular meetings. This is, I understand, a committee of the whole. Parliament has divided things. There are statutes and non-statutes, and it's very hard for people to understand. The non-statutes are just as strong as the regular statutes. So the custom is. And your council will have to work this out with you because the bylaws and they're all new to it, right? That uh, it's very difficult uh, if you're chairing this meeting and the normal practice is it passes around to everybody, perhaps with the deputy mayor first, uh, case you're away, something happens. Uh, but you are ex officio member and this is very hard for council to understand is you have all their rights. You can vote. It's just ironically, you don't, except in some special situations. And it's custom, and I would always announce, and, and I'm recommending, if there's a tie, I declare the tie, and I always have to promote counsel. So I will say, I vote no, and the motion falls. If it's an important tie, like the hospitality house in Dorchester, I found in my whole 30 years career, once where I voted. And uh, uh, it happened to be a great moment. Mr. Mr. In any case, Mr. my Fidel, last question is not for you, but council. Really quickly, the, in our procedure and organization of council bylaw that, that, uh, that we now have for the town of Tantramar, the mayor does vote. Yes, um, I know that, and, and but I'm telling it's, you, it's something it, that we, it creates a problem for neutrality and the things that are coming. That's I, all. Like, and as, I'm just saying. It's, it's, not on the it's not on the tie. It yeah. is on every motion that comes forward, the mayor yeah. votes. Well, uh, in our that doesn't make it right. No, absolutely not. It's anti. And, 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 and for myself, as, as mayor, I don't, I don't like that. Um, yeah. I've stated that uh, publicly in, 
uh, reporting from CHMA yes. and Mr. Work. I, 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 I well. saw that right away. I, I saw, uh, and I'm looking for a bounce with this council between corporatism as chairman of the board and democracy. And I noticed from my investigations, which are very preliminary because I don't have a staff, that the bounce between corporatism is kind of overshadowing the democracy. And I think maybe some of you read about the new phenomenon that's happening with countries that want to look democratic. They're called Frankensteinian states or Frank states. Frank so anyway, that's the end on that one. So, yeah, and for, for my part, yeah. I, 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 I will be submitting things through writing to people, and I apologize sure. to those whose my mail bounced back last night. <laughs> I, I, for my part, I, I believe that I don't like um, that it's in the procedure and organization of council that I get to vote on everything. I don't like that. Um, it's something that we will have to review as council, that, that uh, bylaw among others. Uh, but that's one that governs us, and I think that we need to take a, a hard look at it and figure out what works best for Tantramar. Well, that's I a good thing for your municipal uh, gathering, because this is a brand new thing. It's not perfect. True. It has been tried. Uh, I, uh, I, I believe that the mayor should inform and guide council and find consensus and that kind of stuff. I don't really want to vote on every issue. I, I will tie break, certainly. Um, but I, I don't want to vote on every issue, and that's where that's my stance currently. But that will be up for uh, council to discuss when we get to the to the um, issue of of looking at the procedure and organization of council. And Thank you, Mayor Black. I'm relieved. <laughs> uh, but that is something that you can do in resolutions when you go to municipal meetings. This is this is not perfect. Raymond Murphy and I were the last two old guys, 20 years ago when the Liberals tried to bring this in, we pointed out two problems, and it hurts your situary position is, now that you're natural, being, along with a custom that's supposed to be natural, is that you can be sued or sue, and the new laws have not been vetted in precedent. They have new dictionary words, or their interpretation. They have new legal terms or twist at them a little bit. And I asked, is that been vetted yet in court or do we have to pay for every time we get involved in a situation like even the code of conduct where the definitions have been defined by court? Do we have to pay for that? No. Right. And then uh, this actually is a question. Go ahead. Uh, it has to do with situary responsibilities because they are. They can't get out of that. You aren't. The staff isn't. They are. What's the materiality threshold that the staff looks the other way? The province had one for the council a few years ago, I think, and uh, your CAO can confirm that, was $2,500. Anything under that, unless there was a little 5% flip, was not taken by the auditor as being a problem. But I was wondering, you've got some big projects going here. Where does the staff kind of, you can't watch everything, right? So where does the staff, where, where, where is their threshold? Is, that, is the council got to make that yet? Or are they following the profits? Uh, perhaps you might want to direct that too. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that. Do you want to take a... Thank you for the question, Mr. Feindel. So I can say that, you know, through financial management within every department, that would be something that's constantly monitored on a monthly basis um, by directors, by the entire team at the finance department, whether it be, you know, treasurer, assistant treasurer, um, constantly looking at financial reports, and those go to council as well. Um, going forward, um, we'd have to talk about what's material, what's not with our new auditors. We'll, we, you know, we'll be putting um, the RFP out for auditors. We currently have two auditors, so we'd be going out to the marketplace for that eventually. Um, so it's certainly something that we can discuss with our auditors of the threshold. Is there a norm right now from the provincial government? Um, probably anything under 5,000. Right. Yep. 2,500 to 5,000. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Auditors have much different thresholds. I will be uh, saying things that you probably don't want to discuss with everybody. Buddy, but you should discuss with yourselves uh, through your emails and that you have. And I have to apologize to, to the people that uh, it bounced back to me. But I will forward you uh, documents from experience in court or in committees that are not wrapped up anymore. 
so that you can predict from the past 30 years what you can expect to happen to you in the next four. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Feindel. Any other questions from the board? Yes, uh, Bruce Wark, warktimes.com. Um, I just have one question, and it's a clarification. I'm going back now to the Rural Health Action Group presentation, and the suggestion for a line item on health care in the town budget. Um, first of all, I'm not clear as to how that could come about. Um, I just need a clarification of the CAO's answer on that. The, the idea that uh, the municipality, and, and your also observation, Mayor Black, that, that health care is a provincial responsibility, and that I'm, it, it's not clear to me how there could be a line item on health care in the town budget. Um, I guess I'll, I'll speak first since, since you asked for, for me as well. Um, as I said, the health care, like housing, uh, you know, the, the lines between local government and municipal government get blurred. Um, you could argue pretty soundly that housing and health care should be a concern of the provincial government only, um, but it's through efforts um, with groups like the Rural Health Action Group that we've, act that we've actually taken some positive steps towards getting our hospital back. Uh, they are a community group um, made up of people from uh, from the area, uh, and they've in the past needed a little bit of uh, of help. And uh, I, I may be wrong; maybe uh, Ms. Bourne will correct me. But we've uh, you know done some photocopying for them, or we've given them some paper, or something to that effect. But for the most part, they're doing this all on their own. Um, and you heard the presentation tonight, free of charge. Sometimes uh, the, with the report that they did in the tune of, you know, it could be thousands and thousands of dollars doing this all on their own for free. So you're right. I, t I take your point that having a line item in a municipal budget for health care seems uh, messy. Um, but if it, if it can be sort of in-kind or, or something like that uh, to support a group that's working towards the hospital, I think, that, uh, I think that that would be warranted. But anyway, that's my part. I'll give you my, my mayor answer, and I'll, I'll, the operational answer will be uh, from Ms. Bourne. Thank you for the question, Mr. Work. Um, you know, even, even with the transition to the new entity, it's an item that was discussed at length and, and really in the development of the organizational chart. Um, specifically, Ms. Miller's department deals with matters, social matters, and matters that we wouldn't, you know, ordinarily see in local government. Again, to, you know, just build on uh, what Mayor Black has, has just said, um, it, it impacts the local community. When it comes to doctor recruitment, um, you know, selling the area and the, the impact of that on the community, who better than to sell the area than our own staff working with the community and, uh, you know, the, the Rural Health Action Group, um, what a team that they've, they've mobilized and really been a leader throughout other municipalities in the province for the work that they've done. Um, speaking to Dorchester specifically, I, I, I want to say the budgeted figure or the, the, the amount dispersed last year was probably about $250 to really help with administrative costs. Nothing extensive, but it was on, you know, Dorchester's budget. Um, but I, and I am going to call upon Ms. Miller because she has done, a, you know, uh, an extensive work with, with the group as well as doctor recruitment. Ms. Miller? Thank you. Um, so what I think a lot of these questions are referring to is in uh, 2022, Council directed staff to use some of the existing funds within my budget towards physician recruitment. So we had identified $10,000 towards physician uh, recruitment from a previous line item in my budget. So um, some of the things that we use that for, so for example, the website that the Rural Health Action Group mentioned previously, they had also done a marketing study that we helped um, provides financial support. And then with actual recruitment activities, we hosted a potential physician in um, December. So some of the budget was used for that. So um, we haven't seen a detailed version of the budget, but I don't see why that $10,000 wouldn't still be there. It was very useful last year, and I would hope to continue it again this year. And once we get 
um, kind of our broken out budget, we should be able to identify that. Thank you, Mr. Work. Uh, how much time do we have left? Just a one minute. One minute. One minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, any last uh, quick, quick <coughs> questions? There's one minute left in the 15 minute uh, allotment. Okay. No questions from the audience then. All right. Uh, I would be looking for a motion to adjourn. Let's let's switch it up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh. Motion moved by Deputy Mayor Martin, seconded by Councillor Finney. Oh, Councillor Esterbrooks. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Ms. Beal. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, staff. <laughs>